look, it's happening. And it's a Monday. Go figure. Welcome to Fat Man Beyond. I'm Kevin Smith. I am Mark Bernardin. Hey. Ho, ho, ho. Um, it was neg negligible whether there would be a show tonight, kids. I just got back literally uh, not too long ago. I went to Florida to do two shows on Friday and Saturday in Delray and in Orlando, and they were wonderful, out outdoors, socially distanced and stuff. Uh, then on Sunday, I spent Mother's Day with my sainted mother <laughs> nice. uh, in the Orlando area. Then this morning, uh, I left Florida Flew to Austin to open a movies at Austin City Limits Live. So uh, cut the ribbon and all that stuff. And then flew here to Los Angeles, where I'm now engaged with you fine people. So Mark, three states in six hours. I have not done that. <laughs> Top, man. Top. <sighs> when you get three states in a three-way. Oh. <laughs> it's interstate action as we like to call it, really it. is man <laughs> hardest, hardcore interstate action um so it, it's a miracle that uh, we're actually uh, getting to do a show but that's because uh we're dedicated kids dedicated to uh to uh the art here and dedicated to talking to our guest tonight who will yes. have joining us um, momentarily and whatnot. Uh, and we're not going to have him all night. So we're going to jump right in uh, when that happens. And that guest, kids, is none other than the man responsible for the new Captain America, for Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Strike that, Captain America and the Winter Soldier. Uh, the showrunner, Malcolm Spellman, is going to be with us here tonight. And we're going to geek out with him, man. Indeed. Yeah, we will get to the, the bulk of the show, including another thrilling installment of how hairy are your balls? Let's tell you about them and how to make them less hairy. I know it's the radio drama that the world's been asking for. Everyone always wants to know what to do with nut hair, Mark. <laughs> and they always tune in here to <laughs> Fat Man Beyond to find out what to do about it. They don't come to us for the big stuff, for the issues, political, governance. No, no, no. When they want to know what to do with ball hair, Fat Man Beyond is the place to go, man. And when you come here, you know what we tell you? Get your ass over to, to manscaped.com. Uh, do me a favor. Go there right now, literally right now, manscaped.com. Man, you're going to get 20% off and free shipping with the code FATMAN20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. And use the code Fat man 20, all one word. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped, Mark. <laughs> uh, the thing that I love about this particular ad read is the puns. And my favorite pun is, we're providing a pubic service. This uh, is a pubic service announcement. You're good, man. They didn't have to go into fucking manscaping. They could have went into stand up. They're good. They really could have, man. They really could have. Um, and hey, the, the big news, the reason why there's a pubic service announcement is that they have successfully created the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, which is now available for purchase in the USA and Canada. And it is just as fresh on the stands, man. Fresh on the stands to make your balls as fresh as they can be. We're, we're, we're some of the first people to try the 4.0, man. They sent it to us before they released it to the world, man, because membership has its privileges, kids. And it's incredible. Um, not only does it do the job of fucking, uh, you know, mowing the lawn, so to speak, it is a powerful vibratory device. Do with that what you will. If you tape a toothbrush to it, you could literally have an electric toothbrush as well. It's powerful. Also, very powerful, but kind and gentle. And it's got ceramic blade, skin safe technology. So good, it almost seems as if Manscaped worked with Elon Musk's engineers to ensure your testes are as safe as possible. I, first time I ever tried to groom my balls, Mark, I was uh, but a lad in high school trying to keep things a little more kempt than they were. And uh, I went down with uh, a pair of scissors and you should never, never, Go near that area with a pair of scissors, man. Leave it to the professionals 
leave it to Manscaped because I still got a scar on my nuts. That's what happens when you use those big fucking art class scissors, man. Especially if they're like lefty scissors. Yeah. You're a righty. They gave me the green handled ones, man. How's I supposed to cut with that? So let me tell you something, kids. Thank the Lord Manscaped is here for us, man. I wish they had existed way back in the day. I wouldn't have malformed myself, man. They wouldn't Um, be calling you Saint Nick. Yes, Saint Nick. (laughs) What makes their trimmer different than all the other trimmers? This is a Passover question, isn't it? A new (laughs) multi-function on and off switch can engage a travel lock created for people who like to travel. And, or even if you don't like to travel, I don't like to travel, but I have to travel. And when I'm on the road, I don't want my ball hair growing all long and shaggy. Got to keep it tight. So you can take it with you traveling. This new lawnmower 4.0, man, gives you the ability to turn the 4,000K LED spotlight on and off when needed for more precise shape. There's a light built into it and shit. So you can use it to find your keys at night as well, man. Multiple uses of this. The new trimmer even allows you to customize your trim all over through additional guard lengths with sizes one to four. That's like sometimes you want to take your beard off, but you can't like take it all off. You just want to leave some so you shave it down and stuff. You can do that with your with your do your, your balls need a goatee? Then yeah. here's how you get it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so listen. Get- this is a sleek two-toned matte and gloss finish. Even features a hot foil stamped black chrome Manscaped logo, man. Show that mower off loud and proud. Take it out, show your neighbors. Look at my lawn mower. <laughs> and then he'll be like, what? And you'll be like, look. And you can use it right in front of him and shear yourself like a fucking sheep and whatnot. They'll be impressed. They will. So get 20% off and free shipping with the code FATMAN20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com with the code FATMAN20. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. We thank the good folks at Manscaped for being the proud sponsor of this week's uh, edition of Fat Man Beyond. Let me tell you something, Manscaped beside themselves right now because they didn't know when they were putting down their hard earned ad dollar that they were gonna be putting uh, that ad dollar on a show that was gonna have a quality guest, ladies and gentlemen. Never mind this Robert Kirkman shit. We're always throwing your way. No more D and, and, and Z grade guests. From now on, all A listers, man. And in tonight's guest, he may not be as rich as Robert Kirkman, but who is, except for Elon Musk, maybe. So tell him who we got tonight, Mark. Tonight, we have the head writer of the world's biggest television show, Falcon and Winter Soldier, slash Captain American Winter Soldier, Malcolm Spellman. Hey, Malcolm, hey. how are you, sir? <laughs> yeah, it's good to be here, man. Thank Welcome you. aboard. Thank you for making the time. Um, are you exhausted at this point? Now that the yeah, show is it, it, It's been intense. Um, I, I've never been through nothing like this. Um, I think I've done a good job. Like, like I know you know how people say they avoid the press. I've done a pretty, I've been pretty serious about that. But like, I did a lot of press, and I occasionally, uh, I mean, you know about this from having runs in this business. There's a reality to you to you have moments, and you got to capitalize on them, but not give in to them. And so I'm figuring that out. So it's it's been a, it's been a trip. It's been a trip. Malcolm, uh, I can't identify with that because you are successful. And that's what happens to successful people. Me and Mark, we look at the successful people from the outside. So we can't identify with this moment that you're living in. Shut up, fool. I've seen you have a couple of runs, my friend. (laughs) Um, Speaking of runs, man, like before we dove in, I went and looked at the IMDb and I was expecting after the quality show that I watched. And, you know, I've said many times. I wasn't like jumping in for Falcon and the Winter Soldier when they announced it. I was like, WandaVision. And they said, I'll watch that as well. And then I absolutely fell in love with it. Masterfully made. And so I'm like, all right, this guy must have a long fucking tail going way back to like Hill Street Blues or some such shit. And it's, does it really begin with Empire? Yeah. So the way it went was in 2000, late 2000. I broke in with a spec script out of nowhere, right? And I had that initial run of heat. And 
I sympathize. What's the what's the old boy's name who wrote Boondock Saints? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, oh. But they did the documentary. Story, whatever. I wasn't as hot as him, and I didn't go down as far as him, right? But I had a similar thing where, like, the town fell in love with me for a couple years. I was a hot dude up. I was fresh out of the streets. I didn't know, have any idea how to mount a career. And so I went from being in the streets to motherfuckers coming out of nowhere inviting me to premieres. And I don't really know how to explain it to you guys. I really wasn't in this business. So it was like being put into a TV show. And then after a few years of that, death. And so between that death and empire, you know, a little bit of chair, like I went like four and a half, almost five years with no work. And then little charity here, lost all my reps. Little charity here, a little charity there from people, whatever, but made most of my money outside this industry until until Empire came. It was like most of my career I failed. I've had a 20 year career. Most of it I failed. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I I would I, I understand I'm not sitting here going, yeah, I know you failed. It's unbelievable though to me that you sell a spec in 2000. And for those who are like, what's that? Spec script is like, you know, when you're an outsider and you write a script and even sometimes you're an insider, you write a script unassigned and you just send it in and a bidding war can begin. And then, you know, based on this reaction around town, people invite you in and stuff. What was the name of the script, Malcolm? And did they ever make it? They did not make it. I got one. I got it. I don't want to out people, but it's an important story as to what I was dealing with. So it was called Core. It was about a black kid who uh, wanted, he was a skater and wanted to go to the X Games, you know, kind of like the eight mile story or whatever, right? Uh, we're, we're, we're reworking it now. And, uh, 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 you know, that was out the box back then. This was like a year before Save the Last Dance and about two years before Fast and Furious. So the term multi didn't exist. Right. And, uh, mm-hmm. uh, 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 but it was a script like it, it, it had some sauce to it, right? Like, I think people did feel like I was a real comer. And because I've been outside the system for years, just writing scripts, getting notes, and literally not even sending them to nobody, you know what I'm saying? So, um, and uh, I remember um, as I was going through the development process, you know, I got the note, the note of notes, which was back. So, this is about a black kid. He's hooking up with a burnt up Tony Hawk type. Everyone he's hanging out with is white. The love interest is white or whatever, but we get the note. Um, 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 this hurts me more to tell you than you to hear this, but we have to change the lead character to a white dude. Um, 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 Cause it has to be 100% white. And it's important because that's how bad Hollywood was back then, that that was appropriate to say. Right. You have one black character in here and that is too many. Yeah, and it's and like you got to lose. Uh, you know, just if we could just paint over this area, I think we've got a go project. And, and and it's not like this person was an outlier. Go look at the movies that was being made back then. It's just what it was. You know what I'm saying? I don't even blame them. Um, and I man, I couldn't function in that world. I couldn't. I couldn't make shit happen. Um, um, and that was you know, even though that was the beginning of the heat, it was also the beginning of the end because what this business is telling you is we're going through, you know, they go through their waves out here. Like you look at the nineties, there was a moment where Singleton and Spike and Matty Rich and all these brothers was making movies and sisters too. And then on TV, you had Fresh Prince and Martin and da 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 and UPN and uh, WB, all of that's happened at the same time and then gone, right? And that's what it does. And so I was coming right in after all that shit was gone. And you know, it, 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 it was it was brutal, man. It was a brutal, it's a brutal thing to be up against, man. So yeah, when I mean, the business part- was weird then, right? Cause you had like Cosby show and different world. And you know, th- there was a crest and a wave of black entertainment that vanished by like 2003. Yep. Like fell off a cliff. Yep. Yep. And, and the argument, I mean, it's just, it's fucking cruel because the argument for it is some bullshit and you just can't, it's a completely illogical, these motherfuckers truly believe the shit they're saying. Like I got friends who have now evolved past it, but my own friends used to tell me, well, you gotta understand, 
black leads mean you can't do this overseas or whatever. Da, da, da. And it's just not true. Right. But it don't matter if they believe it to the point they are willing to say it to you as like, hey, Malcolm, two things. Two plus two is four. And black people hurt box office overseas. They don't hurt in sports. They don't hurt in music. And they don't hurt in box office a lot of times. But in all the other times they hurt box office. You know, and, they, and that that thing is now emerging in TV really loudly. It's coming back. It's a fucking awful monster. Um, um, they don't say it as explicitly, but you can see it happening. Anyway, it was, I didn't know how to navigate that shit and my shit died, you know what I'm saying? So when you got the call from Empire, was that like a relief or, and, and was it something- What do you know? Not enough, that's why I was <laughs> talking. Did you- yeah, I had a hard time with it, man. Like, like I always been, like the reason, like I always been someone who was willing to bet on myself um, to a fault. And I mean that like to a fault, you, you have to, that just doesn't work. Not in this business. For at least that didn't work for me. <laughs> and when empire came, I'm trying to, you know, I want to be, you probably have a lot of viewers in the industry. So I want to be, first of all, I, it is the most, one of the most important moments in my life. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to acknowledge that. I didn't know like the idea of me being on staff because I just, despite not working, despite literally being, making my money outside of Hollywood, if you're not in Hollywood, you still haven't learned shit. Right. So I still don't know nothing. I'm 15 years into my career now and I don't really know shit. So I feel like, oh fuck, I'm taking this low level staff job. Is this a step back? Nobody knows it's a hit. You know what I'm saying? And Man, it, it was existential for me, man. Like my rep, it was all these meetings. I had managers at this time. I did not have agents. Um, and they, they were like, bro, they got real me. They're like, man, you ain't working. Fox likes you. If you tell them no, because I've said no to, uh, 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 I'm willing to say this out loud because it's my homeboy. Uh, Chris Morgan had the show Gang Related. And he tried to get me on that. And I was like, nah, I'd heard some, you know, whatever. It just wasn't for me. Mm. And they were, he was like, you know, uh, my, my manager was like, bro, if you say no to this one, you're, it's not no hard feelings. Fox is gonna say this, oh, I get it. What we do, he doesn't dig. And man, you know, so I, I, I listened to my team and jumped on it. And uh, uh, yeah, one of the best things that ever happened to me. And so how long were you there and before you, went someplace else. Cause it seems like after that, bang, bang, bang. And then suddenly Falcon and the Winter Soldier. It, it's, it's, you know, I talk to my, my friends like I, cause I know so many fucking writers, right? And I see so much false humility. I try not to have it when I'm doing interviews because I know how you and Mark and everyone else talks behind the scenes. You know what I'm saying? I know everybody <laughs> thinks they're brilliant. Right. And I just wish people would be more honest about it because the stories would be a little more pure, right? Right. And I got embraced on Empire. Danny, Lee, and Eileen was like, oh, this motherfucker is, he, he's, he's, he's serious. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. whoever he is, you know what I'm saying? He's making a mark. There's no doubt about that. None of them would tell you different. So once I finally got in the game, and started getting to other situations and I'm looking at the competition, I'm like, oh my God, you know what I'm saying? I'm about to, if this is, if they leave me in here, I'm gonna eat everybody's food, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, and, I, and I got a witness like, uh, 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 this is about a whole separate separate issue, not Empire, but I called mm. one of my buddies who's a big, big A-list screenwriter. And I'm like, it's, if this is what I, if this is who I gotta be, I'm good. And you know, the run and, and the run speaks for itself. After that, you know, I, I just couldn't get footing before then to really show what I could do. Um, but it was definitely like once I got once I got in and that's the thing I think people got to understand. Whether or not I'm remarkable doesn't mean shit. First of all, people have to have a reason to give me opportunities. You know, our industry, every venture is closer to 100 million dollars than it is one million dollars. You know what I'm saying in general. And, and, and the reason people hire you 
is not because you're great or brilliant or talented. It, it is about something that translates easily. I was on Empire for the first three years, right? This is the biggest show on TV. That translates. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Don't, they, you know, I, I don't think anyone's read me since Empire. You know what I'm saying? Like for a gig. Right. Mm -hmm. They don't even know if I can write. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, yeah. Success succeeds. So yeah. were you a Marvel kid growing up or, or were you a comics guy at all? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't think they allow you through them doors. They can smell it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they can smell it. And I'm from Berkeley. Um, we had two legendary shops and like, it seems like every city has a legendary shop now, but you know, you, it, it is, I'm talking late seventies, early eighties as a little kid, right? The, the, everybody didn't have legendary shops back then. We had comics and comics and then later best of two worlds. Um, so we grew up, we, I was a neighborhood kid. I'm a real neighborhood kid. You know what I'm saying? Like I, you know, I'm, I, I came into Hollywood with, legal baggage, all that shit, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, but because, you know, Berkeley and the Bay Area is just different, you know what I'm saying? Like you'll see motherfuckers in the comic book shore who go rob a bank, you know what I'm saying? A little bit later, it's just a different breed of person out there. Mm -hmm. uh, we grew up, we grew up with them books. We grew up with a deep relationship with the people at the shops. They knew us by name. And, um, you know, it, it is, you know, I remember the, uh, like, I, I, my memory is bad, but I remember the Warlock series that sort of predated the Infinity uh, Wars, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, the Adam yeah. Warlock series. Yeah, yeah, like, I, 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 my, my game is fairly deep, you know what I'm saying? And so they knew that when I, when I, when I, when I came up to Marvel, they could tell. I mean, they won't fuck with you I'm, if, if I, I don't think so. Anyway, the impression I get is that's a requirement. So who, who, how quickly do you get to Kevin Feige? A ASAP. You mean- is that right? So like your first meeting in, they're like, this is the guy. Second, second meeting. Um, so I come in, I meet with Nate Moore, who's one of their senior execs, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, which turned out to be a blessing for me because Marvel, you know, has a system that we will not be talking about on camera, but which I learned <laughs> to embrace and love but you need a guide, you know what I'm saying? You need someone right. to guide you through it. They, they, I say this, they are not doing that shit by accident. That run is not at all by accident. And so I pitched to Nate and Nate, who's a little bit military and how he does shit, went soft and was like, fuck it. I love this pitch. Here's some notes. I'm hooking you up with Kevin and the, and the parliament and the, all the other senior producers. And um, I get chronic migraines and I had a migraine on the day I went into Kevin, but I had also done something. I was too eager and I'd taken every note and I'd taken them all literally. And I kind of just jammed them in there and the pitch didn't have the same flow. I bombed the pitch. Nate, who does not pull punches, like, yeah, that, that pitch was no good. And so like a month or two passed and I got to assume that basically I was out and they were hearing all the other pitches, you know what I'm saying? The way Marvel works, which is, you know this, bro, from doing Mark, you too probably work it. If you work in features, mm -hmm. they not in features, there's a literally a fucking checklist. Here's the writers who I can hire without losing my job. I don't, I ain't got to read none of them. That I'm just going, he's available. He, she's available. No, it's always he. He's available. He's available. He's available or not. Right. And then they find one and they plug them in. And that's how it goes. Right. Mm -hmm. And at Marvel, because the, the culture is different, Nate, basically, this is my assumption, with the way I bombed that pitch, Nate just told Kevin, you know that dude who sucked? That's the guy for the show. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting the call. How, how, how black was that pitch? By which, I mean to say, <laughs> how much did you already know going in that you wanted to tell a story about blackness in America and blackness in the military and the burdens that a black man has to carry in a superhero world? Like how much did you have of that? I, Mark, I was at 90% black. I'm from the Bay, bro. I went to high school with Huey Newton's niece. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, I, I was at I was at 90% blackness just off the first pitch. <laughs> um, um, they knew what it was. And 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 they knew like whoever was gonna do it was gonna have to come at it from that angle just because we live in the reality we live in, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And 
the stars and stripes do represent what they represent and Anthony Mackie's black. <laughs> uh, are you, I mean, philosophically, are you team Isaiah or are you team Sam? Just personally, not saying like picking a horse in the show, but do you come to it from a place of hope like Sam does? Or do you come from a place of experience the way Isaiah does? 100% Isaiah. And one of the things that was important to me was at no point do we say Isaiah is wrong. Like we want to do something a little bit different. Like, you know, I've written a million stories that are quote hero's journey and shit like that. And you always had this moment, these moments of darkness where you're confronting your fears or you're confronting your dread, whatever the different manifestations of it, right? Isaiah is the living embodiment of Sam's doubt, right? Mm -hmm. De Sam did not take that shield because you could say it's because of Steve Rogers, whatever, but Don Cheeto is there for a reason, you know what I'm saying? And he didn't take that shield because he knew what he was gonna end up saying at the end of this movie millions of people are going to hate him for it and he didn't even know if it was appropriate right like i don't even know if it's cool to take it i don't it, it it's this country and the relationship with it is too weird right and isaiah is the embodiment of that and no point in my opinion did isaiah ever say anything that was wrong and we wanted sam to not overcome that doubt we wanted sam to become cap in the face of that doubt with like, I don't even know if this shit's gonna work. I know millions of people are gonna hate me and I still gotta do it because that ties directly in a weird way. There's a lineage to what Isaiah did. Isaiah knew when he fought for this country, they're gonna burn crosses on his lawn when he came home. You know what I'm saying? And he still went and did it, you know what I'm saying? And so I feel like Sam is continuing that legacy of knowing and acknowledging that this fight must happen uh, in the face of the fact that this fight might not be winnable. Was there ever a chance that you were going to do flashbacks with Isaiah? I don't think I can answer that. I, I They're pretty nice to me. Like, I fuck up a lot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. And, and, but I want to be respectful because they have not smacked my hand in a while. Um, so I'm going to try and be better about Fair enough. And we don't want to lead you down that path. How about this? How close was your initial pitch? The one before you bombed and then two months later got the call back. How close is the initial pitch to what we watched? Um, I got to be careful on this one because I think it's a great story. Since you're saying pitch, I want you to extrapolate. The initial pitch a million miles different, except for the, the characters, a million miles different. Hmm. And, and now as a as a writer, and, and I, based on the conversation, the brief conversation that we've had, Malcolm, I can tell that like uh, the written word has deep meaning to you. you. You, you're a writer, we can just hear it, smell it. Is it difficult for somebody with an independent vision or a vision period to, move into a place where there are so many like, well, ah, you can't do that, you can't do that. Yeah, it, it's, it is very difficult at first and then it's amazing when you embrace it. And it's like the matrix opens up and you're like, oh, this is why these motherfuckers are winning. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like you are part of this giant fucking organism that they only understand half the time, right? But they're so accustomed to it and I do think like from my disposition, it was emotionally really hard. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm, you know. That's what I'm sensing. Like it just, it didn't, and it's not saying like he can't be a team player, but you you have a voice, it's very clear. It, and it they, they have a voice that, you know, people gel nicely with. That's how those movies seem to happen. I, 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 I'm very, very collaborative, but I'm also very, very clear and, forceful like i don't think anyone that's ever worked with me would ever say that like for me my mantra on running a writer's room is of the best day i have in a running a writer's room none of my ideas are on that board so let me say that i'm not one of those motherfuckers that thinks i don't buy into auteur, auteur anything in our industry right um that said 
it's one of the reasons I'm able to do that is I'm clear. I know what we're trying to do and I can communicate that so that everyone can get fired up and do their best version. And, and it was, it took some getting used to their process and man, like Nate and Zoe to they assign you two execs who are in the room with you. Mm. That has like, you know, I got irked at these motherfuckers at the, uh, the, uh, uh, AV club who were acting like I was being fake about really being impressed with and enjoying the experience, right? Um, they're like, he tries to spin it as it is, and it's not, I wouldn't even do that. I just would just not answer. But I found it to be amazing. Once you, once you give into it, first of all, it's not like you're not leading. You know what I'm saying? Right. You are just mindful of the fact that <laughs> people who pay your bills are also right there in the room with you. Right. Now, Kevin, here's one of the things that's unique about the Marvel creator producers. Their system, as far as I know, no other studio does this. Nate and Zoe get assigned one project. They are with that project from the beginning of outline when they sit in the room with the writers. This is every Marvel movie, right? Through script, onto set, through post. They don't do no other projects. So, and for just for context for those watching, Normally, a studio exec has 20 projects that they're overseeing. What Malcolm's saying is that two execs will have one project that they shepherd all the from cradle to grave without working on anything else. Yep. Wow. Yep. And and Nate's been doing that shit for like 12 years with Ryan Coogler, with the Russos, with, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so their bedside manner is impeccable. Like they work with fucking writers, you know what I'm saying? Like that's the thing is like people think they're in there saying, here's what to do. Creatively, they can pitch as well as anyone you're gonna get in there, right? The first three times they do it, it's humiliating because you're like, this is a suit. But then you're realizing, no, wait, this motherfucker, all he does is make movies. You know what I'm saying? That's 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 what he does. And so you you you've read me correctly. I I have a fragile disposition in certain ways and it really fucked me up at first. And then when I embraced it and I had a great, I sat with Nate and Zoe and told them where I was uncomfortable. And man, once we formed that creative family, it was fucking magic. It was mad. Everything just was, it, it was, yeah, it was great. And it helps that you're dealing with characters who've been handled by so many people like you realize at a certain point i would imagine like well i mean I, I don't have the marvel experience but you know when i was working on masters of the universe the netflix cartoon with mark the whole idea was like all right so many other people have have handled this and have added spokes to the wheel and if we're lucky we get to add another strong spoke but like you know it's tough to feel like completely like this is mine because it belongs to so many other people before you ever get to touch it. And the best you can hope for is that you define it so that going forward, everybody thinks of that character in conjunction with you vice versa. And I think you definitely fucking nailed that on that series, man. Yeah, like, I can't, I can't. What you just said is exactly it. it. It is, you know, one of my favorite things to do is describe to people like I grow up in Berkeley from the neighborhood reading comics, I never think I'm gonna be shit in life, right? I have no expectations of anything good happening in my life. 20 something, 30 years later, I'm on the second floor of the Marvel building where Thanos is gloved, life-size glove is there and the real three Iron Man suits from beginning to the most modern one are in the lobby. Wow. Security buzzes me through, this is my first day at Marvel. To my left, life-size statue of uh, T'Challa, to my right, as I'm walking glass walls encasing Thor's hammer, Ant-Man's helmet, Steve's book, right? I make a left. Now the walls are painted wall to wall with Marvel characters in action scenes, right? Black Panther fighting Cap, da da da. And there's shelves of comic books. And then Steve, Steve's uh, shield encasing glass. Each writer's room is named after a different Avenger. I get Iron Man, right? I walk into Iron Man and the concept art is laid out on the walls. And by now, after everything I've been through in Hollywood, I'm as cynical as, I don't even 
to this day feel like I'm part of this industry. You know what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. of what these people did to me. And man, I got choked up. It was hard not to cry. The concept art for Sam with that fucking shield because I was a kid who grew up on this shit and getting to what you're saying, there's no way you can be possessive over this shit. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? It, it is so much bigger than you. And it's been handled so fucking well by these people. You are lucky to be in here to be part of it if you're really a fan. And so I think your wheels and the spokes thing and define it is is a flawless description of the best you can hope for. Um, where is uh, here? I, I know I'm always trying to like not throw you into a place where you're like, I can't talk about that, but I've we all read that that there's going to be a Captain America four, and that see that look on Malcolm's face, like maybe you did, <laughs> maybe you didn't. That's right. Uh, that's true. I, I read somewhere online if like if that was true, would that writing have started already? First of all, I would say this: if <laughs> Kevin hasn't said it then you don't, you cannot assume it's true. Um, <laughs> true. And the rest you can probably Kevin imagine. Feige. We're talking about the most important Kevin in the world, Kevin Feige. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's Kevin. There's one Kevin in Hollywood. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. I, I literally live behind the Hollywood sign. Fuck. <laughs> I'm joking, man. No, um, no you're right, I though. Can't. There's only one Kevin that matters. So until he said it, it's not, you're saying it's not a truth. Yeah, thing. it's not real. Is, uh, is there any desire on your part? Because I, I know there's there's an appetite for it, um, not the least of which among Kevin and I, to tell that young Isaiah story, to tell the fucking like, let's do it. Let's do the indoctrination. Let's do the injection. Let's do the betrayals. Let's do all of it. Yeah, I mean, it would, but how do you do it right? You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you do like, I felt, I felt very comfortable with how we handled what we handled, right? You you just gotta, it's gotta be the right person and then you gotta do it right because you're basically talking about a tragedy, a true mm-hmm. tragedy at, at Marvel, which is different. Like we dealt with race, we dealt with privilege, we dealt with, you know, the feeling of with displaced people and powerlessness. We dealt with a lot of big relevant themes, but I don't think our show, our series was a tragedy. And, you know, for Isaiah, there's just, there's no, that's just, it is, you know, that's a tough thing to do. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But I would- When we, when we think about it, we think about like, oh, to see him in action, but you're right. Like it's the, it's the Titanic. We know where the story eventually ends and it's not a fucking happy place. And, And just like, as we watched in Captain America, the first Avenger, he rescues everybody and he's given a hero's welcome and the third act begins and shit. That would not be the case. Nope. For Isaiah. Nope. You're right. I hadn't I like, about that. It might be. It, yeah, it, it's it's a very tough because you have to set up these, you would have to set up these men so that you care about them being betrayed. And the whole time you're watching this, it's like watching fucking Dr. Frankenstein movie. Like, wait, what? And now that you don't like, it'd be tough. You'd get, you'd probably get a nice teaser where they send Isaiah after uh, Winter Soldier, you know what I'm saying? And after that, man, you in some very serious waters, you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, but if if they ever did anything with that character, I would hope they called me first, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I mean, there there is the version of that that's Saving Private Ryan, right? Like that movie, Tom Hanks, it's a tragedy for that for that character. Like there's joy and there's triumph and there's spirit and there's hope and there's all those things, but that motherfucker dies on a bridge. Spoiler, everybody. That's what happens in Saving Private Ryan. You know, like it's it's dark, darker than perhaps Marvel wants to go, but there's probably a path through it that you still get to do the valor and the dream and what happens when the dream is deferred. But Mark, do you feel like you do get to do that? Like like when you're really like, I read that book, Bloods, that, you know, Douglas Gar like I, the 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 relentlessness of this country's relationship with our people is like i mean you know hey dude you get to walk point like at every single moment it's like you know what i'm saying i i, I wonder 
how you eke out like when the other soldiers are fucking being racist and then you're saving them in the next scene, you know what I'm saying? And they're not, I mean, are we being fraudulent or real? And they're not learning their lesson. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I mean, it's a harsh, it's a harsh, harsh look at that. <laughs> Mark's but it's like, like Fuck this, I'll write it. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, man, you, you come and EP that shit, get paid and we'll make it happen. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, you know, it's the 1619 project, right? It's look, here's yes. an awful story. It's a harsh look, but it's true. And therefore it has value. I, I and agree. Like, and you are correct in that all the research we did, like when you listen, when you look at these great, great black soldiers, man, what they did in the face of what they are doing it for. And it wasn't just World War II. It wasn't just Korea. It was Vietnam also, you know what I'm saying? Right now, the, in the current military, there is they deal with, you know, signs of white, you know, white supremacist organizations infiltrating, and they, and they're still out there fighting. It, it is true that what Sam embodies is that, that I'm a fight anyway. Like I, I don't, you know, whether or not this works, this is one shot we got to take along with some shots back home, along with some shots over here until someone finds a way to bring something truth to what we've been trying to say for 400 years, you know what I'm saying? Um, in addition to that, the, the, um, one of the things that I loved that went into the show and felt very Marvel to me, because the show of course felt very cur current, finger on the pulse, but classic Marvel, we got to taste in the very first episode with the, the notion of uh, you don't get paid to be a superhero, <laughs> like real world fallibility, which we, I don't, I don't think like, I know that it hasn't been explored spe specifically like you guys did, but I don't even think like other than Peter talking about like, I found a computer in the garbage on my way home. Generally speaking, they haven't really dealt with the, the topic at all. Um, when did, was that, in the pitch too, or did that just come out later on? Yeah, I mean, the, that storyline was in the pitch. So the bank scene probably was not because I couldn't be that specific at the moment, mm. but I knew I knew their family business. I had done some research on black fishermen in Louisiana and I knew that uh, uh, their family was struggling because of what these banks are doing and driving these people out of business. And, and it is funny because that scene, Kevin, hit on two different levels, right? On one level, it was Sam is black before he's the Falcon and can't get a loan. Right. But then the level, like one of the things that pulled in so many execs at Marvel is like, wait a minute, this is a huge deal. If we're gonna start talking about how superheroes make a living, like the volume of notes that came in just on that and the <laughs> amount of meetings on like, well, how do they, what is, you know what I'm saying? Like, it seems hella simple to say he has military contracts, right? But you know, man, anyone who writes, you guys both know, we got all kinds of real convoluted shit before you get down to something, you know, that simple, whatever. That, yeah, that shit was a trip. Like, it, that, that really, that really touched something for fans that surprised me. Like, that, that discussion, like, they, whether they knew it or not, they'd been waiting to have that discussion. It's, it's after a decade of these movies, it's just comic book thinking. Like, you know, you sit around as a kid afterwards and discuss who could do what and like who could beat who. It's in the same like area as like, how do they get paid? And so I, I've, it definitely touched a nerve with everybody in a good way with like, I hadn't thought about that. I haven't heard it before, but it's enjoyable to hear that it gave Marvel pause as well going, wait a second. How do they get paid? We've never really <laughs> thought about this. Like one guy's super rich, but the rest of them, who fucking knows? Um, All right, let's ask one more question and we gotta let you go because we know you're on your way out. It's easy for, for an audience and even you know professionals to impart intentionality to shit that happens all the time. But did you have any idea that Zemo would be the fucking meme generator that Zemo became? Like, how do you, do you feel that on set when he's fucking pounding it out on the dance floor you i can't claim i said so we that we knew he was going to become there was going to be a zemo cut but <laughs> i will say this as dailies were coming in and rough cuts were coming in it was clear that daniel was fucking dialed in 
Like he was just, he understood we had described, and I don't even know if that description made it to him because you know, you do so many revisions, but we described Zemo, his interaction with Sam and Bucky, but particularly Bucky as, you know, a genius playing with a broken toy, right? And the spirit of that he took, and man, I had sent him an email, man. I was like, man, you was just playing with the scenes and just like, it was like jazz, dude. It was just like, he was doing whatever he wants and it all felt natural. And just there's so many little details in a given scene where Zemo is deepening it. Like it's, yeah, you're laughing at it, but, but the actor is so fucking present that it feels like exactly what Zemo would have done. You know what I'm saying? So now nah, I know about the memes, but I definitely knew that he, he was crushing it. I knew he was taking shit out the park. <laughs> um, it was a tough act to follow. Uh, not just WandaVision on Disney Plus, but fucking season two of The Mandalorian. And it's safe to say you guys, pun intended, spread your fucking wings, man. It was epic. Absolutely. Thank epic. you, man. We, and one last thing, just for my own edification. So as showrunner, do you get to go to set when they're shooting? Were you there when they shot all the episodes? Yeah, I was out there. I was out there in the beginning. And then, you know, I came back. Um, the, the way, you know, you got Kari was with us in the writer's room. Yeah, And then Zoe, Nate's mini-me, right, um, is on set with them. And we just, we're able to work remotely on rewrites because the continuity is completely fucking intact. That's the genius of their system. They, we are all one hub. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So me personally, Kevin, after many, I you know, I'm not a dude who loves set anymore. I'm <laughs> I prefer if it can be done from far away, you know, I prefer to do that. When did when did set die for you? Was it during Empire? I'm not gonna tell you, but <laughs> you circumspect man, you <laughs> for, it's so wild to me because you like in, in 2000 you write your first spec, it's 2021, and somewhere in between there, you got to the place already in your career where you're like, I hate going to set. <laughs> it, it's yeah, it, that's another episode, man. Like it, it is when the relate. Listen, like the relationship with Anthony. No offense, I've had amazing relationship with creative relationship with actors, right? Yeah, yeah. But the connection with Anthony was just special. You know what I'm saying? Like, you you know that tension, dude, when actors have an issue with something, and you're like, oh fuck, you know they're gonna come for me or da da da. There was never any of that with him. We was, we was creatively in tune with each other and easy all the way through this thing. And so part of it is, I don't know if I really needed to be in set because I could be on the phone with him for two or three hours talking about a scene and get it done that way. But it's the opposite of that sometimes too. Sometimes there's no respect and there's no love and you got to be there and with a motherfucker who, if they decide not to step out, step out their trailer, you know what I'm saying? Your whole shit's going to shut down and you don't want to be the one who caused that. So you're eating shit. Um, so it's just a thing like, you know, I love, I got to admit the last few shows, everyone's been fucking amazing. Like, you know, I work with my wife on her show with Octavia, who is if the prototype of genius and just professional, awesome human being on set, her. So maybe it's coming back to me, but I got old school traumas from years past. Oh. Um, but Anthony was a dream. That's the best relationship I ever had with an actor. Um, it shows in the work, man. You got beautiful work out. And he's a wonderful, always has been a wonderful actor, but man, oh man, he he rose. He, yeah, he's he, special, bro. Yeah, he became, he took it to another level with this project. Yeah. Um, we loved it, man. I love Thank that. Thank you. I, it means a lot, man. You know, I know y'all. Y'all are serious about about your stuff, about your your, your drama. So I I really appreciate it, and uh, and I I appreciate y'all having me. For sure, man. It's it's so special that your first script got shaved at the black dude. Yeah. And then now it all circles back around like we let's put a black dude in this white shit. That's right. <laughs> no, that's, I hadn't thought about it like that, but yeah, that's that's pretty poetic, Mark. It all comes around, man. Yeah. All right, y'all. All right. Be good, Thanks, man. Thank Malcolm. you. Malcolm. Everyone give it up for Malcolm. Yeah. Late, y'all. Peace. Um, I, I, I love Tim. He's my kind of a friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I'm Malcolm. sure that I'm sh I, I, there's some part of me that thinks that the Marvel publicists were like, why does he have to curse so much? Like, that's, 
I know that, like, I'm normally that guy. And, like, it was so refreshing to be like, is that what it sounds like? Like when somebody's just incredibly refreshingly frank and like doesn't kind of blow smoke about the business. Um, boy, he's that, there's a, there's a story that should inspire you kids. He got his first taste of success 20 years ago and it took 20 fucking years for him to catch up to this level of success. Um, patience, patience, yeah. and be true to yourself apparently as well. And keep working it and, and, and be open to the new scenarios, you know, like I'm talking about, like, I'm not sure if I was ready to be a staff writer on Empire. It's like, all right, got to surrender to it, got to learn how to do it, and then eventually take it over. And it seems like for him, Falcon Winter Soldier was the same thing. Like, all right, I'm resisting this this system and this environment, and then I got to surrender to it and understand it, and then that way we can all succeed. Um, it makes me want to watch the show again. Yeah, yeah. And it also makes me want to theorize who that actor who made him hate set was. But I have my ideas. I have my theories. You think so? Ah, uh, yeah. Next time, baby. Oh, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm. I think I'm, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It's he's he's just so fucking awesome because most people, you know, are like, uh, "Oh, it was great. Everything's great." And like, you know, it was great. But he was just like, "This sucked. That sucked. <laughs> people suck." <laughs> I love that kind of real. Uh, okay, fuck, man. Uh, that, that was good. good. I wish, yeah, I wish we had him more. He had some shit to do, so we only had him for a little window. But God, in that time, he gave fucking quality. And Absolutely. I always love when we get an insight into how the sausage is made, particularly the sausage that we love to consume oh so much. Um, hearing like the the inside, the nitty gritty, hearing that detail about the execs who don't have multiple projects, but only one that they follow from fucking cradle to grave. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that don't happen anywhere else. No, like most studios have two kinds of execs. They have development execs who work on the scripts and stuff. And then current execs who cover shows that are in production already on the air. And they all have lots of shit to do. So nobody's following the show from beginning to end. Nobody's solely focused on one show during that process. And so to get that level of attention, you know, it's, it's, yeah, like if, if you're concerned about an executive is that they don't understand the material and they can't give the time and the, and the effort to it, Marvel seems to have absolved that concern, which is, yeah, no, they know as much about it as you do. They're an active member of, of the storytelling team. And so they, you know, to Malcolm's point, like good ideas win. And, uh, and if they have good ideas, then invite them in. Um, he was great. I feel, you know, I feel, I, I feel like, like, like this is what like a wham bam thank you man feels like. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He came in, rocked our worlds, and he's fucking gone. It's like where, who was that masked man? Did he leave some money on the counter? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that interview was so good. I, you know what? I need a a CBD smoke, Mark. Really, a clove? Cigarette? No, cloves are illegal. I've come to find out. Um, oh, really? so, yeah, who knew? So what instead is this is a non THC, non marijuana, hemp, CBD infused pre-roll for the good. I'll take your word for it. But yes. In case Mark Zuckerberg was curious, this is not marijuana. This is just a CBD pre-roll cigarette. And I think after that in intense, real interview, like where I just feel like we got thoroughly fucked well. I think I deserve a, a smoke. Excellent. You've earned it. You, you hit three states today. Tell me about it. Um, all right. Well, shit. <laughs> the guest is gone. <coughs> so that means. <coughs> <coughs> Those CBD smokes hit hard. <laughs> they hard. really do. Uh, with our guest gone, folks, that leads us into the uh, only next part, the only part of the show that uh, we could possibly go to next, which is the heart, the girth of the show. If what we just had was the shiny helmet, this is the long, thick-ass, luscious, veiny neck of the show that is the news. Mr. Mark Bernardin, who's right over there, over there, over there, there he is. 
He is an old news hound, kids. You didn't know that about him, did you? You thought he was just a great writer? No. He's a news writer as well at one point, man, but he left that world behind. He abandoned it. He walked away from it. But it still calls to him every once in a while. He'll get a call in the middle of the night, and they're like, can you har break some hard news for us, Mark, like you did back in the old days? And he'll go out and do it. And then periodically, he throws a little news our way as well, man. A little secondhand news. Mr. Mark Bernardin is now here going to give you the news. Mark, what's the news? Uh, well, the news, the, the the biggest news this week, at least it felt like the biggest news to me at any rate, was, uh, was the trailer that Marvel had dropped for the go back to the movies, everybody. Just please go see some stuff. Like, let's get Smiling Stan Lee to help <laughs> talk you through the reasons why we should all go back to the theater. And also, let's tell you what you'll be seeing once you return to the theater. And in doing so, they revealed some stuff that we knew, like we knew they were making an Eternals movie. We hadn't seen any footage from it. So now we've got our first look at the Eternals movie. We knew they were making Black Panther 2. We did not know that it would be called Wakanda Forever, which is the perfect name for Black Panther 2. Um, we knew there was a Captain Marvel 2, but we didn't know that it was <coughs> the Marvels. And now it will somehow wrap its arms around the fact that we now have three characters who have some connection to Captain Marvel. Um, Spectrum and Ms. Marvel and the titular Captain Marvel. Mm. Um, we also separately learned that Loki um, would be shifting from fr Sundays, right? Fridays, Sundays, whatever the day, yeah, to Wednesdays. Um, and it'll be premiering on June 9th instead of June 11th. Um, all of which is fucking awesome. Like it's all just glittery gold that was delivered <laughs> unto us um, <clears throat> the best part of that trailer, other than the uh, glimpse um, at, you know, the Eternals, <clears throat> the them using the number four, mm -hmm. shit like that, of course, is it opened with Stan's uh, voiceover. And, you know, the voiceover was so pitch perfect, you forgot for a second that he's not here anymore. Mm -hmm. seemed like it was recorded just for that fucking spot <laughs> but Jim McLaughlin um, I believe is responsible for that chunk of text that Stan read um, really? yeah we gotta we get more details on that let me see if we, he had written to me he had texted me let me see if I could pull it up but we were talking you know I was like oh that trailer and he was like uh he said, I shit you not. I wrote the Stan bit for Stan in 2017. And I said, you wrote it? He said, yep, crazy story. Remind me to tell you sometime. <laughs> well, remind yeah. him. Remind him. Hey, Bamf boy, get in here and get us Jim McLaughlin. And while you're at it, uh, rustle up Victor Garber as well. Hey, Bamf boy. Bamf. <laughs> <laughs> sounded so defeated bam <laughs> if you keep calling him bamf boy that's exactly he's dobby the house off at this point <laughs> <laughs> right don't give him a fucking sock mark or else we'll lose him <laughs> um how did you start watching uh the bad batch i did watch bad batch so before we dive into the news since you are a star wars bona fide star wars man who owns a bona fide Star Wars bar. An intergalactic space cantina, you mean. My bad, my bad, yes. A, a spaceport-themed bar. It's just um, a brand agnostic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you will be our, our designated bad batcher. So let's hear it. How was it compared with JC that is such a big fucking Star Wars fan? I, a lot of people think I am because of the movies and shit, but JC knows all the extended universe shit and whatnot and whatnot. So you don't have to do catch up for any of these projects or cartoons. You've watched them. All, Correct. So. Yeah. And I'll, I'm going to say something controversial here. I'm going to go where Malcolm wouldn't go. Controversial is, Ooh. uh, I may have liked bad batch more than Mandalorian. Are you shitting? One episode of The Bad Batch? Two, well, we got two. We got a 71-minute episode, and then we got a 22-minute episode on Friday. So we got a, a, a movie's worth. We got 
four episodes essentially of Mandalorian in the first week of Bad Batch in terms of time. And uh to me, like I'm a I'm a, a new hope guy, I'm a return of the Jedi guy, I'm not like the Empire Strikes Back guy. And this had the the swashbuckling and the fun and the humor I felt that was more a new hope than Empire Strikes Back. Whereas I feel like the Mandalorian kind of picks up totally where the Empire Strikes Back finished. This felt like like uh, great adventure Star Wars to me, which I, I really loved. Um, the uh, who who who's in charge? Of, so Dave Filoni is the creator, kind of overseer, right. um, but they've got a new guy whose name I'm spacing on um, that has kind of come up through the system. Uh, and so the Filoni, bad Filoni co-wrote the first episode. The first episode, yeah. I mean, it's definitely like his offspring. It's it's his idea, <coughs> um, and he just has another guy. He's like Feige. I think for the, the star Wars animation now, and he's kind of let his children go and run. Um, and it opens with the clone Wars logo that burns up into a bad batch logo. So, you know, it's going to be a direct sequel to the clone Wars. And then you get, uh, like right off the bat. I know one of the things we've talked about is like, when is this show going to take place? It takes place concurrently with episode three so you get to see palpatine's speech from episode three from like different planets and different you know clone commanders it's pretty cool uh the way that they kind of integrate it into the star wars we've known forever and then kind of take it in a totally new direction any new characters um we have the new, the big new character is a character named Omega, who is a young, uh, kind of like adolescent female, um, who is, uh, we don't know much about her. She's never been off Camino, So you get to see her experience what stars look like for the first time or, uh, put her hands down in dirt, um, which is kind of fun to explore. Like, oh, this is somebody who's been on a, on a metal box in the middle of an ocean her whole life um but i think the idea being that uh she is a f a faulty clone just like the bad batch guys are um which is also kind of a cool thing uh i know on this show mark has talked a lot about how star wars is kind of about <coughs> family where you know the <coughs> the prequel trilogy you have kind of obi-wan and anakin and it's a kind of a, a brotherly family relationship there. And then Luke and Vader in the original trilogy. Uh, and then in the Mandalorian, it's uh, Mando and Grogu. So you're getting kind of a different, another new kind of look on that with the Bad Batch, these A-team like uh, mercenaries who are trying to figure out their place in the world. And now they're raising a kid while they're trying to, you know, they've been programmed to be these people. Uh, the the galaxy has changed, and now they're figuring out how to navigate that on their own. But also, they have a a kid that they're raising alongside it. It's almost like uh, like Full House. Like you've got uh, Danny Tanner is Hunter, and then you've got like the two two or three weird uncles. They all live in a spaceship. Everywhere you look, everywhere the force is around, it's all around. Can I tell you my theory about Omega, JC? And I haven't seen the second episode, so mm -hmm. I don't know if they reveal this or not. I don't know if this is a thing that they're holding on to or will ever answer. But my theory is that Omega is a clone of Moff Tarkin that Ooh. has gone somewhat awry. And so, and, and, and Tarkin doesn't want her, which is why she's sort of banging around this fucking space station. And she's faulty because maybe it was supposed to be a he, turned out to be a she, whatever that is. Um, that's my theory, which will fuel all kinds of fucking identities <laughs> and identities and all that stuff. Can I, I throw out my theory? Here's mm -hmm. my theory. I haven't even watched the show. 
Yeah. <coughs> that girl <coughs> is Boba Fett's sister. Why not? I mean, it would be, like, technically speaking, right? Because if, right? if they're clones, then it would be Boba's sister. And they'd be, yeah, right around the same age. Boba Fett, so hot right now. So hot. <laughs> My uh, my initial thought was that it was a clone of Palpatine, like the first failed kind of clone of Palpatine. But haven't I don't they, know. Haven't they done that storyline already too much? <laughs> yeah. Nobody, Nobody wants more Palpatine. Palpatine. Let's just put Palpatine on the back <laughs> But uh, I, I was also going to say, I think this is the most interesting time in the Star Wars galaxy in that you're watching the new Republic or the old Republic is gone this is the the birth of the time in Star Wars that we all love. And you get to see that a little bit in these these episodes in that it's uh like in the Mandalorian you're watching and they're still trying to figure out like what currency. Ah, I don't want to use imperial credits. Ah, oh, imperial credits still work. What about new republic credits? That doesn't work. In in Bad Batch it's like no, it's imperial credits. End of discussion. So they got to lace in kind of very subtly how quickly the kind of uh, military, militar, the, not, I'm not going to get that word out right now. It's been a long day. <laughs> uh, the, like the fascists take over extremely quickly in this episode, meaning uh, within days of Palpatine declaring himself empire, uh, emperor, it's it's everywhere they've got troops everywhere everybody's got to register everybody's got to get a number everybody this is the new money throw your old money away exchange your old money five years after the rebellion killed palpatine it's still floundering all over the place which i think is also kind of a an interesting thing that they're they're playing with uh kind of in the background which i really enjoyed in the chat they want you to bring up chain codes Oh, chain, chain codes, it's uh, everybody needs to register essentially for an ID number or a social security number, which is if they want to travel, if they want to be on an imperial controlled planet, they need to register, um, which, you know, is is analogous to, uh, you know, what we've seen tons of times on on our, uh, you know, in real life. Um, I mean, I think the parallels to, you know, Nazism are very clear in the original Star Wars trilogy, and I they're building up to that and and expanding on that with uh, with details in this for sure. Um, and it's I I also like it is kind of like it's kind of the like yin to the yang of Mandalorian, where it's almost like you're getting the same kind of story but set at opposite ends of uh of uh, this governmental system which i thought was was uh kind of fun how many episodes is it gonna be <clears throat> 16 episodes and we got Whoa. we're two in the fuck kind of like crazy ass old school number is that who does 16 nobody I mean, I guess they can do whatever they want. The, they're still using all the animation style and everything is very Clone Wars. So they're not reinventing the wheel with new computer model. Like they're not building stuff from scratch. They have seven, eight years of Clone Wars foundation that they're building off of. So I think they can probably take that extra scratch and give us 16 episodes instead of the Disney plus eight or 10. Um, all right. I dug it. You, uh, you heard it here, kids. Banff Boys exclusive. And did you hear that chat? Mark dug it. I did dig it. No, Mark I... likes it, everybody. <laughs> oh, Mark, yeah. I, I guess we fucking just sped past that. There should be a, some sort of bell that we ring when Mark likes it. <laughs> Like, Stinks for Christ. everybody. Yes. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Uh, you liked episode one, Mark? I did. I did. I, I didn't see the second one yet, but I mean, the animation's great. You know, even and even though I'm 
not nearly the Clone Wars completist as a, as a, as a JC might be. I knew enough to know what was happening. I knew enough to, to know that when you heard the Order 66 be put out, that like what that meant and, and the fact that our guys were not obeying it and what that means. Um, you know, I think they've always done a very masterful job at making the same person sound different enough to be five separate characters. Um, and I did find it kind of emotional <laughs> towards the end of it. There's betrayal, there's embracing, there's, you know, sort of parental desires and urges and, and you know, what it means to be atypical in a, in a, in a sea of people who are the same. And I think it's always a really interesting story. So now I'm on board. Well done, Ken. There it is. Two votes, two up votes <clears throat> from uh, our fat man beyond panel of two. <laughs> Bad batch. Um, all right. To yes. the news, Mark. What's to going news. on in the news? Uh, we were talking about. Um, talking about the Marvel rundown of stuff. Marvel trailer and uh, Stan's voice in it and stuff. I'm trying to think of what, what I liked best. I mean, I loved hearing the old man's voice again. Like I cried the first time I saw that trailer. I was like, oh, um, you know, they showed us more Shang-Chi, but we'd already seen some Shang-Chi. The, the Eternals piece looked interesting, mm. like big old wide shots out in nature and shit. There was that story that broke um, that, uh, that, you know, Kevin Feige, when presenting Eternals to, I guess, members of the Disney, you know, high council or, or whatever, you know, had to explain to them, as was explained to him, they're like, we did that all in camera. Like, there's no CG on some of those shots. It's literally just Chloe Zhao saying, I want to shoot on a beach and let me show you what happens when a really talented DP can get, you know, the time and the space to make art. And like, yeah, we don't need to razzle dazzle it. Like we can make it actually the way they used to make movies for a hundred years, which is we're going to a place and we shoot it. Um, hey, listen, don't fucking like tell Kevin Feige stories like that. <laughs> you know, we want to, we want to, we want come on, man. We want more Marvel guests. <laughs> we want, and you might want to work there one day. So right. mind. For the record, kids, nothing Kevin Feige does is wrong. It's all good. It's all great. Um, um, no, it did look great. It did? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Eternal stuff looks really strong. Never mind. I was going to say a thing about a thing, but I'm not going to, because to your point, at some point, I would like to work for Marvel. Well, oh, it was a critical thing? Well, it was just, remember, like, just after that broke, there was a, a big banner on IMDb of, like, the Eternals cast. Yes. But, like... Yeah, what was... Why did you sent... Mark sent me this image of the Eternals cast that was at the top of IMDb. And he said, like, can you believe it or something? And I didn't quite understand if it was, like, you objecting to the artwork or... <clears throat> I said, is it that, you know, because it was basically the dude from Game of Thrones. Rob Stark. Right up front with his arms out spread like this and all the multicultural character or multiculti as Malcolm just taught us. The Indeed. Word, um, standing behind him. And I was like, what? Is it that the white man is <laughs> putting everyone back? <laughs> <laughs> what, was was your, what was it? It was it was the weird kind of photoshoppy like it, it was it felt like an unfinished piece of art. So it, it was the quality of the picture. You were like, this feels like fucking action figure artwork or something. Yeah, feels like for the, your first big giant amazing still photo of the Eternals in costume, it would have been I don't know a little better. But hey, trying, neither here nor there. Trying to get you a fucking job, and you just I know, man, I know that goddamn grave. Um, mm. Let's talk about a, a Marvel thing that's not a Marvel thing, but is a Marvel thing. Mm. Um, the trailer for Venom 2. Uh, what is it? There will be carnage? No, there will be carnage. There will be carnage. Um, dropped this morning. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, look, first Venom I didn't see in theaters. I saw on home video and... I fucking enjoyed the shit out of it. I was like, wow, who, who knew? It was like, it's got, it's got a sense of humor to it. 
That was directed by Ruben Fleischer. Uh, this new one directed by Precious himself, Andy fucking Circus, right? Indeed. He had done one of those Jungle, jungle Book movies, the one that played on Netflix. Mm -hmm. uh, but we all know him from like fucking Gollum, fucking Planet of the Apes, fucking Alfred coming up. This guy wears a lot of hats. He does. He's a, he's a multi-hyphenate. He truly is fucking a circus life for me. High doodle DD, as they say. So uh, the trailer was fucking fun, the one that they dropped today. And we got our first look, well, our second look at Cletus Cassidy. First time mm -hmm. we saw him with a Raggedy Ann and Andy fright wig at the end of <laughs> First Venom, but uh, now they've given them more of a shorter crop do and stuff. And we got our first look at the cinematic carnage. Indeed. Um, with, uh, you know, which is basically for those who don't follow that closely, thinner red venom. <laughs> but he looks the, like the uh, red vine to, uh, uh, yes, to, to uh, fat licorice of venom. Glad you finished that one. I was like, <laughs> where are we going with this, man? <laughs> Is this a Twizzler thing? <laughs> Don't piss those people off. Um, so the trailer looks uh, fucking good and fun. It, it didn't see any, you no, know, like, uh, I guess the bad guy is Carnage. Mm. So there's your fucking villain, Woody Harrelson chewing the scenery. And uh, what's his name? Fucking uh, Tom. Uh, Tom Hardy. Just fucking chewing the scenery yet again, man, in that good way. Like, uh, I, he's also the voice of Venom, isn't he? Yes. Yeah, I'm sure it's pitch shifted and, and altered and tweaked within an inch of its life, but I think he's doing both of those things. Um, he seems to be having a good time. I look forward to it. Uh, you know, I would have liked to have seen a lot more Carnage, but I'm going to see that when I see the movie, I'm sure. I'm sure trailer number two will give you more of it, and then the movie will give you all of it. Um, um, but, uh, but I also found myself for the rest of the day fucking listening to one <laughs> alone. good use of music. What'd you think of the trailer? Um, I feel about the trailer the same way I kind of felt about the first movie, which was okay. I guess we're doing this now. <laughs> like I, I have no attachment to Venom as a character. He was never, I mean, I remember when the symbiote gets introduced in secret wars and when it becomes a whole thing, in, in Spider-Man books, but like, it was never a thing I needed more of personally. And the first movie is just like that shit crazy in ways that I could not have expected a movie to be. Um, <clears throat> and it feels like this trailer was like, oh yeah, hold my beer, we'll be more bad shit crazy. And, uh, and you know, threaten to eat the nice Chinese lady who owns the bodega down the street a lot. Um, you know, I, I feel like, when it arrives on on home viewing, I will happily tune in. Um, but I, it, it's not a. I don't think I'm running out to the theater to go see it. Is that right? You won't. Yeah. Uh, I didn't. I didn't go out to see the first one in the theater, and then when I watched it at home, I was like, "Oh, I would have actually enjoyed this." So I think <laughs> I will actually go see this one uh, in a theater. I'm. You know, I'm. I'm not. I wasn't one of those people that's like, I want the world to open, man. I'm fucking tired of this shit. I was like, I get it. We all got to hide from the germ. Um, but, you know, I've had my double shots now for a while. And, and the numbers here in California keep fucking dropping. There's a day last week where nobody died from fucking COVID and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we're getting back to that place where the world is going to start opening up more and more. And I'll be honest with you, like, Six months ago, I couldn't conceive of going to sit in a movie theater unless it was like a private rented theater like Moneybags Bernardin does every once in a while and shit. When he goes all Robert Kirkman fucking rents out a whole goddamn movie theater for him and his wife so they can fucking make out and shit and watch the movies. And well, we all can't be Kirkman. I mean, I hear he's buying the arc lights, all of them, just for him. Makes sense. Makes <laughs> fucking sense. Pocket change for a guy like Kirkman. Come on. Um, but uh, I find myself like, you know, I'll just wear a mask. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to go to the movies again. Uh, that Marvel trailer did kind of psych me up. Where I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, go. movies are worth risking my life for. Yeah, I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So uh, what, other, what other news can we talk about? Um, Warner Brothers um, and, uh, working with... J.J. Abrams and uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates. 
a big story broke in the Hollywood Reporter, kind of digging into precisely what version of uh, the Man of Steel they're going to present. Oh my God, yeah, I mean, we, we missed that story. That was a huge fucking story. When did that happen? Um, that happened, I want to say it was like Tuesday or Wednesday of last week. So um, the story, kids, of course, everybody watching this show already knows, but it, I don't, I think it was the Hollywood Reporter announced that like Warner Brothers is doing Black Superman. Right. And Which, they, you know, I feel like we kind of thought was a real thing that was happening. But the new wrinkle is because there's different ways to go. There's there's Kal El, the traditional version of Superman that we've had. There's Val Zod, Al Clark Kent, correct. There's Val Zod. We, we talked about on this show, like years ago, like ha, ha, what an interesting take it would be if it was Clark Kent to have this boy in Kansas mm -hmm. raised by you know this white family maybe. And he's a black kid. Like it just makes that version of the Superman story, you know, because a lot of people have been like, why does it have to be Clark Kent? Let it be Cal Vanellis or let it be, you know, the other one and stuff. Um, I do feel like I can go either way. I'm happy with whichever version they give us. But based on the discussion we had years ago, like I always thought that would be kind of cool to be like, mm -hmm. how, how does Clark Kent's story change? You know, he's already treated like a, a kind of outcast in a lot of the versions of the stories we've seen, and he looks like everybody else. It adds like another real world wrinkle to it. If like people like Clark's weird, and he's also like the only black kid in this Kansas school. So that, I mean, that's ripe with storytelling potential. Um, I do understand when people are like, I don't need it to be Clark Kent. I'll take you know, just like Michael Jordan himself has said, like, I don't know why you would do Clark Kent. They already have Calvin Elsa. He showed off a very fucking like comic book savvy amount of mm -hmm. knowledge about, you know, beyond just the saying Superman, anybody could be like Clark Kent, Superman, but he went deep with the other two as well. So I get the two schools of thought, you know, the people who are like, oh, that'd be fucking amazing if it was a Clark Kent. And the people who are like, I think it's stupid if it's Clark Kent. I, I'm happy either way, whichever version they give us, I'm down for. But what I read between the lines of all these stories, and tell me if I'm wrong, is Michael Jordan is going to be playing whoever the character is. <laughs> um, not according to him, because he was, quoted, right? he was quoted at the top of this Hollywood, Hollywood Reporter piece saying, he interviewed when his uh, Amazon movie Without Remorse was coming out. And he, you know, somebody asked him, it's like, well, you know, clearly they're talking about, you know, wanting you to play Superman. He's like, no, nah, that's not for me. I will happily just watch when it makes it to the theater. Now, maybe that's a Marvel style, like, I'm not doing it until I'm doing it. Or, yeah, because you know, he's like, you know what? It ain't going to a theater. It's going to HBO Max. Ah! Or something like that. <laughs> but didn't he, like, I, I remember him talking about wanting to do it. Like, yeah. About six months to a year ago, it preceded all this JJ chatter. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe not even a year ago, about six months. Like the JJ deal happened. And then another story that kind of broke out was, I thought, maybe I'm crazy, Michael Jordan wanting to play or them or the studio interested in him playing Superman. And now it feels like this, uh, another story to solidify what might have been rumor i don't know what are your thoughts yeah i mean i i i feel the same way you feel which is you know i honestly don't care which version of of superman they do there's a hundred percent an interesting version of kal-el being a, a person of color landing in kansas in 1958 or whatever um and and for all of those social wrinkles that you get to add to what is already a story about an adopted kid who's an outsider um, you're just sort of bolstering both of those sort of elements. Um, and then what it means, similar to the story that, you know, what we're talking to, to Malcolm about before, what it means to be that character with that much power in a world that would probably be afraid of him for any number of reasons that don't even include him being an alien. Um, and then what is your responsibility towards these people? What is your perspective towards your own power? in a place where, you know, you're watching atrocities being committed and you have the capacity to fix them, but potentially not the responsibility to do so. I think all that's really interesting. That said, 
I don't know a ton about Calvin Ellis or Val Zod, but I'm sure there are legit stories to be told on that angle too. You know, what happens Why when you- Why is nobody talking about Milestone Superman? Oh, Icon and Rocket and yeah, the hardware? Icon. I mean, I think they're, they're, they're definitely doing a static shock live action movie. Um, and that's probably um, a bit of a shoehorn into the rest of the Milestone universe. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, maybe there's some version where that's part of a long game um the collision of all those universes and if dc you know whatever they're calling their movie initiative at this point is about anything it's about multiverses and so there's 100 percent the world in which post flashpoint you are collapsing lots of these multiverses into the same thing or at the very least getting to visit a bunch of them um the milestone the dakota verse absolutely potentially one of them um but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm here for Michael B. Jordan if he wants to play fucking Superman or Val Zod or Calvin Ellis, or like he said, I just want to watch it, you know, and, and lend some support behind it. But, you know, and the other part of this story is that JJ will probably not be directing this Superman movie. Um, he won't be. He won't be. I think that, that he feels, Warner Brothers feels, all parties concerned feel that if you're going to do the black Superman movie, you should probably have a director of color um, to get behind the lens on that. And so now there's the, the, the hot race for which black person is going to direct black Superman and Blade, which currently does not have a director. Um, Blade didn't have a presence in that trailer, did it? It did not, it did not. Um, you know, which I don't know if it's a matter of they don't have the confidence in it, which I don't think is the case because it's Marvel. I, I just think they have nothing for it. That maybe it's phase five. Yeah, you know, I think that they're they're a far they're a ways away from having very much um, to say about Blade, and for as important a character as Blade is to you know the people to the fans, um, it might not be as important to the MCU as Fantastic Four is, and so they continue to kind of plant a flag, reminding you that Fantastic Four is coming. As am I. Just a thought of a Kevin Feige <laughs> controlled Fantastic Four. Oh my God. Think about how good that can be. Uh, too good. <laughs> Remember when they brought a Spider Man back and how good it was? And like, oh my God, they didn't bother to tell us his origin story anymore. They just dove in and you got yeah. fucking Tom Holland and shit. Like, they could do me that way with Fantastic Four. I don't need no origin and shit. But I bet <laughs> they do an origin. They probably will, I think. Because, you know, it's, it's a, it's a series of characters and it's a franchise that people all have some familiarity with, but very little knowledge of. And so I think you need to reintroduce those characters back to the mainstream in a way you don't have to with Spider-Man. It's like, oh yeah, it's fucking Spider-Man. We've just had four origin stories in the last 10 years. You know who that guy is. All right, what's the next story? Uh, the next story is, you know, in the, in the ongoing saga of uh, Joss Whedon v... Um, the good people of Hollywood slash common sense. Um, Do you see this shit? Is this the Gal Gadot story? This is the Gal Gadot story. Holy crap. Like, you know, we, anyone who watches this show probably of course knows and remembers that uh, Ray Fisher, you know, fucking made his Twitter statements and, and, and started saying his, you know, Joss Whedon is not a good guy and, and harass people or whatever and just put that out there and people like beat it back and whatnot and then gal gadot one day just like jason momoa co-signed it and said like you know i, I hear ray let him speak his truth or whatever the fuck and there had been a rumor that gal gadot had gotten into a, like a little something with joss whedon on set and then that started popping up in the press, mm-hmm. people talking about it. But then Gal Gadot didn't say anything about it. Then Gal Gadot did say something about it, but very little, but seemed to confirm that there was something. And now just this week, Gal Gadot was on Israeli TV and tell him what she did, Mark. Um, she said, it wasn't a very long statement, but it was, I had my issues with Joss and I handled it. He threatened my career and said that if I do something, he will make sure my career is miserable. And I took care of it on the spot, Gadot said. Um, 
I, you know what, man? Like, sometimes I, I want, how do I say this without sounding whatever? Hold on. I'm, I'm going to try to phrase it. Sometimes I wonder if I should have done a little bit more with my career. You know what I'm saying? Instead of just Kevin Smith over and over and over and over again. Um, you know, and like with, with the advent and success the last 10 years plus of superhero comic book movies, particularly as a guy who was always into this shit long, you know, before fucking the business took notice of it, you know, one could make the assertion that like, he, why isn't he making one of those fucking movies? And as I've said many times that I'm just not really, those movies are beyond my talent capability and they take a long time and there are plenty of very talented people who are willing to make those movies. Ain't nobody wants to make a Kevin Smith movie except Kevin Smith, so forth and so on. Um, but every once in a while, Mark, mm -hmm. in three small hours of the morning, yes, I'm alone and there's no streaming and no audience and, and nobody to entertain. And when I'm just alone with my thoughts and having a, a puff of a CBD infused hemp only cigarette Facebook. Sometimes I say to myself, I wonder what it'd be like to be X, Y, or Z person. And over the course of my career, I have had this thought. And I, I, I'm not somebody who ever watched Buffy. I never watched Firefly. Um, but I saw Joss's two Avengers movies and stuff. But there have definitely been moments in my career where I was like, I wonder what it'd be like to be Joss Whedon. Like, instead of me, instead of just doing what I do, what would it be like to be that universally beloved? Um, I, I, don't, I don't wonder that anymore, Mark. <laughs> that question has been answered. Something like success... You know, I'm not going to blanket everybody, but like, you know, who says something like that? I, like, I'm, I'm just, I always try to put it into like my, my mindset and I, I can't, like, there's no circumstances under which I'd be telling somebody, you'll never eat lunch in this town again, or fucking threatening their fucking career. Number one, <clears throat> that is repugnant to me. It's an anathema to the creative community to will somebody or threaten somebody's creativity. You know, people like that, I, like anybody that fucking makes it this much harder for somebody to go have fun at this job, to uh, make him pretend and potentially ruins it for that person that they, you know, fuck around with. Like those are some of the worst fucking people in this business. Now, good thing Gal Gadot, you know, it didn't ruin her where she's like, I'm leaving this business. But there are a lot of other people along the way, and I'm not saying, and I know Joss Whedon's done this, but there's a, you know, a litter of bodies in this town of people who are not even in this town. People have been chased out of this town by people who say shit like that. Like, that just blows my mind. Generally, you know, I'm always kind of like, oh, well, I'll stay out of this and I have no opinion. But like, come on, man, like fucking, you can't say stupid shit like you know i'll fucking ruin you in this business like what what do you what do you think this is an episode of fucking dynasty like it's just such a weird thing man so she flat out said that it happened mm -hmm. and you know it's i don't know maybe like you know when you have a movie that makes a billion dollars and the whole world says you're great like maybe you get so full of yourself that you feel like you can say something like to Gal Gadot, who I, I've never met, but seems like a fucking incredibly sweet person. And mind you, wasn't this Justice League shoot after Wonder Woman? Mm -hmm. So she's already like a fucking huge star, right? Like, do you know the fucking chutzpah it takes to say to some giant billion dollar grocer, like somebody who has been the face of a movie that has made a billion fucking dollars, the character, the titular character, pun intended, no pun intended, Wonder Woman herself. And you're going to be like, I can, I'll ruin you in this town. I'll like. 
Not to mention, he was the second director on this movie. <laughs> it, it, like, it just, I, to me, it's just, it's baffling. But, like, I, there was a part of me that, like, when she said, oh, there were things and blah, blah, blah. But I was like, it couldn't have been. There's, like, I was like, there's no way he, because I'd heard around the halls that he threatened her career. Not threatened her physically, but was, like, mm -hmm. literally, like, fucking... I can ruin you in this business. And I was like, there's no fucking way. That's like something out of a 30s Hollywood movie or something like that. Um, and then I saw like a kind of confirmation a few months ago in the press where I was like, well, he maybe he did say something. And again, I don't know this guy or anything, but I just can't imagine anybody like, you gotta be like, you know, just have an ounce of strategic fucking interest in your own career to not fucking shoot yourself in the foot or something like that. But hearing this now, like when she, you know, I couldn't, obviously I don't speak what Israeli or Hebrew or something. So I, I heard her say it, but I had to read the translation. And in reading the translation, I was just like, he literally did. The rumors were absolutely true. And she just, as the only other party who could fucking confirm or deny it, mm -hmm. she flat out confirmed what, had been rumored for a long time that he threatened her fucking future. Like that blows my mind. I don't even think like, could a Spielberg get away with that? Like could a Quentin Tarantino, like is there such a thing as a, a director that like, I would believe that if a director said that to me, like if I can, Joss Whedon said that to me, I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> All right, Firefly, keep buzzing. Fucking you're right. Warm. But like, what what must have happened to get to that fucking point right like what was it what was the thing he said to do do you think it was the flash falling on her bit um it very well could have been because there was a rumor that they had a body double for that mm -hmm. for that reason exactly yeah i mean it's got to be i mean that what they've said or or at least what gal is i don't know if she said it or somebody around her said it was that um, it was about protecting the integrity of her character. Like she thought he was taking her character in a weird direction, uh, a weird, too aggressive direction after the Wonder Woman performance of, of the movie itself. But it, maybe it could be not just like as vague as like, I didn't like the direction he was taking the character, but it could be that specific moment. Yeah, because or it could be, it could be things that we've never even seen. You know, it could be a thing that she flat out refused to do and didn't make the movie because she wouldn't do it. I mean, like, again, this is America's sweetheart, man. Like, <laughs> this is the world's sweetheart. <laughs> I know. It's literally Wonder Woman. And you're going to be like, you'll never eat lunch in this town again. That's, that's, crazy. he didn't say that, kids. I keep repeating that just because that's a title of an 80s book that was an old fucking like Hollywood exec kind of threat. What did he say exactly? Do you have it right there? Um, I mean, he, according to what she say, he said. What she said was, um, he threatened my career and said that if I do something, he will make sure my career is miserable. And I took care of it on the spot. That's like, that's so fucked up to me. Yeah. I mean, it's. I've, and I've been in this business 27 years, man. And like, you think at a certain point, like, if you haven't seen it all, you've at least heard it all. And that just like, you got to be, you got to really believe in yourself in a big, bad way to be like, hey, Wonder Woman, I'm the fucking boss here. Not to uh, mention, like, you know, I don't, I don't know. Was, wasn't he like, isn't he like a Mr. Feminist or something like that? Like, why is he? I mean, that, that was, that's part of the, the, the issue. The, the fact that for so long in his career, he, uh, he was able to drape himself in the virtuous armor of a, a feminist, of a, a, a man who told women stories, who told stories of women with agency and with power. And, you know, and that's a thing that sort of followed him throughout his career and which he absolutely embraced, you know? You know what, man, like, not for nothing, but like, like I'm a, I've worked with tough talent and sometimes I've worked with talent that, you know, was tough, but you'll never know it. Like I've never shared it, 
And then I've worked with talent that was so tough, I couldn't help but fucking show it. A la the case of like Bruce Willis and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's a risk when you tell those tales out of school because uh, that's what they call biting the hand that feeds. <clears throat> and so there's, you know, like a fucking chance of blowback or whatever the fuck. Um, in this instance, I personally, I feel like fear for his own career longevity like would have prevented him from going going at her let alone threatening her you know what i'm saying like again you're this like you pointed out you're the second director you're not even like this is my fucking vision you're the guy doing like pickups and you're gonna right. pick a fight with one of the but i mean if, if you follow that trajectory though if you follow the trajectory from I was, a, a, you know, I wrote the first draft of Speed. I did rewrites on Toy Story while I was on staff at Roseanne. And then I got Buffy and then I get Angel and then Firefly. And then I get, um, I get to make a Firefly movie. And then from that, I get Avengers and then Avengers 2. And suddenly my movies have grossed five or six billion dollars. And then Warner Brothers comes to me to rescue their failing um, floundering Justice League movie. So clearly they need me more than I need them. And so I'm doing them a favor. And so I have to, you know, it's my way or the highway. Uh, I don't necessarily want to be here, but you've asked me to do this and so I'm doing it. And so that gives me a sense of control and power that's em emboldened by the fact that I'm on this meteoric career run. Um, all of which feeds an ego. You know, and it, and it seems as if, especially in, in Hollywood, but as is ever, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so he felt like he was untouchable and that he wanted what he wanted and how dare this actress, you know, not give it to me, you know, uh, and whether that extends as Ray Fisher claims to him as well. Um, it's telling that he did not have issues like this with Jason Momoa as far as we know, or Ben Affleck, as far as we know, or Henry Cavill, as far as we know. Also, I don't know if it was in this piece or another piece, but somewhere she indicated, a gal indicated that she wasn't on set with Ray and Jason. Like, you know, they all shot separately, I guess. And, and so she, I guess she wasn't there when like his, he was doing his shit with with Ray mm -hmm. and she was kind of almost I, I don't know I'm now putting words in it but she wasn't it wasn't like a main unit where everybody was around right where this happened um the uh yeah just nuts what happens yeah. next do you think I mean I we, we're, we're in a time of accountability um you know if, if we look at a what began with you know, sort of Kevin Spacey and, and Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby, and now has kind of trickled, you know, made its way through Hollywood. And now we're also having this conversation about Scott Rudin, who apparently had been a nightmare for decades in Hollywood, um, doing things that if not downright cruel and unethical, um, may or may not have been illegal from a simple assault and battery perspective. Um, you know, what happens to that guy? You know, what, what, and how does Hollywood treat people for whom they have a vested financial interest compared to people for whom action would be the right thing? Um, and that's, that is always the crux. How useful are you in Hollywood will sort of dictate how Hollywood treats your infidelities and discretions and so forth and so on. So is Joss Whedon somebody that Hollywood wants to have stuff more business with? Then if so, he will do the thing that Hollywood has always done, which is, you will go away for a while and you will let things cool off and then you will do a rehabilitation tour and then you'll get to go back to work. You know, the, the Mel Gibson playbook, you know, or you're Bill Cosby and, you know, you'll never work in this town again, but retire on the island of your choice um, once you serve your time in jail as a rich, 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 rich man. Crazy. But it don't look good. <laughs> Don't look good. It's just such a like a weird flip from, you know, like how wasn't that long ago that he was beloved and golden boy? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was 
two years ago, the, the world was excited to see his new HBO show, his return to television after, you know, sort of a decade away making movies, you know, and he was excited about it and HBO was thrilled about it and fans were eagerly awaiting it. And I'm not sure how the Nevers is performing, but I don't think very many people are talking about it. Um, no, but I mean, I, I don't know if it's because of the quality of the show or Joss Whedon, or if it's because everyone's talking about the other fucking HBO show, Mayor of Easttown, Easton. Right. Um, that show is getting fucking huge buzz. Yeah. I mean, they yeah, even have really a sketch this week. <laughs> and it's really good. Yeah, it's a great show. Uh, yeah. do you watch, have you watched The Nevers? Um, I have. I've seen all the episodes of The Nevers because, you know, despite the fact that I have very serious problems with Joss Whedon, you know, every now and again, he'll do a thing that I like, you know, or, or, or there's a turn of phrase or there's a concept or a conceit um, that I find interesting. And it's, it's the exercise at this point of trying to separate the art from the artist and knowing full well that while this is a created by Joss Whedon show and produced by Joss Whedon, there's lots of other people who worked on it. Um, some of whom I like quite a bit. And so trying to divorce the guy from the work, especially when it's a collective work, feels like a, a, a sort of yoga that's worth learning how to do. Um, it's not great, it's uneven, but there's moments of it that I think are really cool. Um, this is apropos of absolutely nothing. Yes. But I keep forgetting to bring this up. Have you watched Them yet? Um, I have not. Mm. You need <laughs> to watch it. Do I? So we could talk about it. It's powerful, powerful stuff. And legit horrifying. Um, but you know, it's there are there are there's there are there are moments that are as tough as you know the the Tulsa massacre as depicted in Watchmen um, and as some of the the racist stuff in Lovecraft Country. It's a very similar sensibility and style to Lovecraft Country. Beautifully mm -hmm. made, like fucking gorgeous show. Um, but it's, I, I would be curious to see your take on it. Yeah, I mean, I I, I made a decision like seeing the first trailers about it and, and kind of reading a little bit about what it was of how much of this pain do I need to take on board as I, you know, go throughout my life, yeah. you know, and how much of what feels like could be, and I haven't seen it, so I don't know, um, but could be exploitation of that pain for very specific effect. Um, and it's like, it, it has become a taste thing for me of like, you know what I'm just not in the mood for <laughs> is, is this, is this very specific kind of violence and this very specific kind of, of, of agony and torture and, and, and viscera in it the is. same way that like, you know, I remember having friends like, you know what? I've never been in the mood to watch Schindler's List. And it's like, is there a mood for that? Um, but you know, absolutely. Like at some point you do take on, you've reached your limit of how much sort of Holocaust material you might want if you happen to be a person of the, the, the chosen faith who may or may not have relatives who have, you know, perished in, 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 in the Holocaust. How much of that do you need to carry with you in your soul? And so I feel like I'm getting to that point where I'm like, I don't know if I need more of this anymore. I've, I, I've, it, it was a tough sit mm. and not because it's like, this is made by amateurs. Like it's incredibly well-made, but there's, there was a legit concept, a, a concept in that show that, le, that will legit has legit scarred me and I will carry for fucking life. You know, every once in a while I meet people like, Hey man, that fucking shot of the walrus and tusk when you fucking zoom out. <laughs> yeah. That's my fucking nightmare fuel. Like I'll never fucking scrub that from my brain. And you know, I, I always thought that I was like, Oh, that's charming. I legit ran into something that reminded me of like years and years ago, Jason Mewes at one point, like he was, he came in the office and he was so fucking horrified and haunted. And I was like, what happened? And he was like, some guy asked me to look at a video online and it was an, a video of somebody getting their head cut off in real life. Like it was a beheading of, of 
of uh, I, I don't know what he said. Some some place was in America. Mm. Um, but he was like, still to this day, if you bring it up, he's just like, oh my god, I like I still wish to God that I was not shown that and stuff. There is there's shit in them that that I felt like that, you know, and and you know I was not the community depicted in the show. Mm. I it was just horrifying. So you you may be wise to stay away. <laughs> But again, like, it's not like it's not well made. It's just, mm -hmm. like you said, it's just like, you know what? I, I just can't handle that much. Like, it, like, you know, it took like Jennifer, my wife didn't want to watch Nomadland for a long ass time. Cause she's like, I'm, it's going to break my heart. I know it. Like, I know mm -hmm. how fucking sad it's going to make me. Why do I want to do that to myself? And you're like, well, I don't know, art, but like, I guess we don't have to watch everything, do we? <laughs> the or like, the, the older you get, it's one of those, you know what, I'm making an educated decision, which is like, maybe good, just I don't know if I need it. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm debating if I'm going to watch, and it's not that much of a debate because I will, but Barry Jenkins is, uh, is releasing the Underground Railroad. Um, his series for Amazon, which is like this 10 part adaptation of a Pulitzer Prize winning novel that is about the legitimate literal Underground Railroad. And it's like, okay, well, it's a story set in slavery and it's about that, you know, liberation and it's about that trauma and that, that experience that I ordinarily would probably steer clear of simply because I don't really need any more slavery stories, but it's Barry Jenkins. And it's like, and what I've seen of it is gorgeous and it's beautiful and I'm sure it's rendered with care and with, you know, great skill. And so like, I'll give it a look, um, maybe, <laughs> if I'm in the mood for that. Um, but, but yeah, like as of late, especially given the last like year and a half in America, you know, how, the, the, the number of depictions of black pain that I need has, uh, has dwindled precipitously <laughs> in recent years. <laughs> um, all right, back to the news. Back to the news. Um, this past week um, was a very busy week in the world of Mark Miller, who I keep wanting to say his name is Mark Millar, but I know is not. We know it's Mark Miller, though. But yeah, we know it's Mark Miller. It looks like phonetically, it looks like Mark Millar, but it's Mark Miller. And you know, he's Scottish, and I expected some fucking English or some spin. Not English. I realize now that is the wrong way to put on that. Scottish. Um, One of my favorite comic book writers of all time. Um, of course, creator of uh, Kick-Ass and Hit Girl. But my guy, he did amazing work over at Marvel. But uh, I will never fucking forget his run on Swamp Thing at DC. That was where I first got introduced to his work. And I, I, he's, you know, and he then he went on to build his... Millerverse, which he then sold to Netflix for like 30 million bucks. Indeed. And so the, the fruit, the first fruits of that collaboration with Netflix are beginning to, uh, to, to reveal themselves to the world. The um, Hick -Girl, Hick -Girl show? No, but Jupiter's Legacy, um, which was a comic book that he wrote. Um, that's a Netflix show. That's a Netflix show. That's based on Mark Millar's thing? Indeed. I didn't Indeed. even know. Is it superheroes? It's very much superheroes. I had no, like, I didn't know. I, I knew, I saw the title and honestly, I thought it was like a fucking tween thing. So I just kept going. I didn't know it was fucking Mark, Mil Mark Miller. I almost, yeah. Yeah, I almost did it right there. Mark you, Millar. You almost did it because you kind of want to. Um, i doing it my whole life until one day he corrected me. He was like, it's Miller, man, Miller. Like, leave me alone. It's fucking Miller. <laughs> Who's um, Mark Millar? <laughs> um, wow. That's uh well, that's good. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it was the number one show on Netflix over the weekend that it premiered. It's, you know, and, and both domestically and apparently around the world. Um, so muscle top to him. I haven't seen any of it yet. It's been a, it's been a week. And so I haven't gotten this done. Like I got the bad batch in, like, that's the one that I watched. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll, I will for sure get to it and be able to report back. Um, but he has delivered an update of all the things that are happening. There's still a new Kingsman, the Kingsman movie, which is coming out soon. He's hard at work on a six episode live action spy series um, that he's at work with for Netflix, I'm assuming. Um, another of his comics called The Magic Order mm. is back in active development at Netflix as well. Um, that it was initially supposed to go into production, but then they took a break 
for um, pandemic related um, issues as many, many things did. And so they had a chance to rethink it. And so now they're going back to it. He's writing more comics. He's got a book called American Jesus, which is coming into, uh, into being at Netflix. Um, there's an animated adaptation of Super Crooks, um, which is a superpowered heist comic about eight supervillains. Hey, can you, for one fucking second, stop unfurling all 28 feet of Mark Miller's dick? Jeez. Um, this guy's doing too much. When do we get a piece of the action? You know, I guess we need to create a universe. Fuck. Look at how fucking successful that guy is. You know what? He's making shit. We're sitting online talking about it. One of us is winning in this scenario. God damn it. It's always the Scotch. The, the <laughs> Scotch, Mark. They rule the world. They're, you know, they're workers. <laughs> They're go-getters. They just they take it all and they leave. They, we get the what's left, the dregs. Indeed. They are the uh, 1%. The Scottish are the 1% of the world. We're the 99. <laughs> but yeah, basically. He's guy. Like he's a good guy. I mean, it's not like I spent to copious amounts of time with him, but I believe he's a very good guy. He's always been a good guy to me. And every interaction that he's had with people that I know and, and like everyone likes Mark Miller. So is I'm happy to hear that shit's going well for him. I will now look at this Jupiter. What is it? Jupiter's rising. Jupiter's legacy. Jupiter. Oh shit! Thank God you said that. It yeah, sounded yeah. like honestly, I thought it was like that fucking um, movie that they did. You know, the Wachowskis did. Oh right. Jupiter. That was Jupiter Rising, wasn't it? Fuck. I think it was um, called Jupiter Rising. Now, now I have to look because a that movie's batshit crazy. Yeah, where what's his name? The, the Mister Magic Mike. He plays a cat man or a dog man or something like that. Jupiter Ascending. Jupiter Ascending, and what is this show called? Jupiter's Legacy. So I would be forgiven. You would be like those two things were related in some way. And in fact, I thought it was rather ballsy that Netflix <laughs> is like, didn't that movie flop hard? Well, we're doubling the fuck down. Let's do more. Not that at all, apparently. No. Apparently you can't copyright or trademark the term Jupiter, Mark. Uh, I, I hear that it belongs to a planet who is not overly litigious. I think it belongs to all of us is the point. <laughs> um, what else we got? Uh, let's see. Uh, Blake Lively and Diablo Cody um, are both teaming up to adapt Dark Horse's Lady Killer comic book for Netflix. And I'm not familiar with this title. Um, Blake Lively will be playing um, the perfect 1950s housewife who, when not catering to the needs of her family, leads a secret life as a highly trained killer for hire. Um, she really likes the second job and her husband has no idea. So it's a little long kiss goodnight. It's a little bit killing Evie, um, but also period and- uh, a, little, a little mad many as well. A little mad many. Um, so yeah, it, it seems like it, it scratches lots of itches, um, especially for an actress who's looking for a, a, a big role to play and for a writer to kind of dig into some fun, subversive content. All right. So that's happening. There are some departures oh, on the flash. Diablo Cody won an Oscar, right? Um, she did indeed. For, um, here, here's, a little, here, here's a little inside info. Ready? What you got? Little fucking Hollywood dish. The only reason I ever joined Twitter was because I was reading in Entertainment Weekly that Diablo Cody tweeted something. And I was like, what, what is it? What's a tweet? And I read her pithy comment and I was like, I couldn't make a pithy comment. And so I joined Twitter as well. So whenever I hear Diablo Cody, naturally, of course, I think of Juno and shit, but I also think of like, she was my bridge to Twitter. And it's not like I knew her. It's not like I called her up and I was like, D, teach me Twitter. I just, <laughs> honestly, I was like, she's young and hip. Perhaps this is something I should look into. <laughs> she was your Sherpa into the Twitter mountains. She did, She just didn't know it. Hey, hit your wagon to the stars, my friend. Hell yeah, man. Do what the famous people do. That's what my grandmother told me. She said, you'll never go wrong doing what the famous people do. Unless it's awful, in which case. He's Bill Cosby. She said, especially that Bill Cosby. <laughs> He's got his head screwed on straight. 
Those are the comedy albums my mother let me listen to. She wouldn't let me listen to Carlin. She wouldn't let me listen to Red Fox. These were albums that my father had bought me and stuff. But I was allowed to listen to Cosby because she always said she's like, he works clean. And I had all of those albums as well. So did I. Believe me, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm just, this is, you know what, we should not, we should just leave it and move on. But to, to my brother, Russell, I was literally I just going to say that. I, I mean, to people of a certain age, like, again, let's all first agree that, uh, that what Bill Cosby did is horrible. Yes. We're just talking about there was a time we didn't know this. And in our childhood, enjoyed a whole side of an album called To Russell, My Brother, Who I Slept With. And it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a classic bit. We, we can't do this. We should just move on. <laughs> I feel Again. like there's people that are like, yeah, but like, you know, but Woody is still dot, dot, dot. I'm not making excuses for anybody, but I do, you know, I agree with you that. Yeah, no, there is the particular <laughs> yoga of having grown up the era that we did, the age that we are of discovering that people for whom not not to say idolized, but were deep fans of turned out to be some of the worst people on the planet. Yeah. And so trying to find a way to square that circle of, I still have fondness for this stuff, even if I can have no fondness for the person. Um, it's tough. I purged all that stuff out of my fucking, cause I had it, I had it on record. I had it on cassette. I had it on CD. I had, you know, the fucking iTunes versions. And mm -hmm. that was it after that. But every once in a while, one pops up because, you know, unless you delete or double delete something out of iTunes, mm -hmm. you're just doing a random play. It'll, you know, it'll just grab. And every once in a while, like we'll be in the car driving and suddenly you'll start hearing Noah. <laughs> I used to play Buck Buck. No. Oh, don't. Don't. <laughs> don't. Oh God, such, a, you know, uh, anyway, we should anyway. not be talking about this. This is how our show gets canceled, Mark. They're like, they did a 10 minute appreciation on the classic works of, yeah, no, we're not, we're not, we're not. A2 comicbook.com. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, fuck, I don't want to lose those guys. I said, That's all I got, comicbook.com anymore. AV Club, we were right. Yes, that's the only part of the show that they will show <laughs> Cosby apologists, question mark. <laughs> uh, there are, moving on, uh, there are two, there was an announcement of two departures from The Flash. Um, the TV show The Flash, not the, the TV movie. TV show The Flash. The movie. the movie is going full steam ahead, but Tom Cavanaugh and Carlos Valdez are leaving The Flash. Um, well, I mean, look, it's a big loss because they've been there. Well, Carlos has been there since day one. And well, so they've both been there since day one. So it's Tom. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm sure they're just like, how, how many different ways can I say, Barry, you got to do something, you know, like it's been seven years. Um, you know, it doesn't seem to be ending bitterly. No, no, they're, they're, they are both open to and the show is open to having them you know make guest appearances you know as as time goes on but yeah to your point like they they have been doing different iterations on relatively the same kind of show for a long while and at some point as an artist i have to imagine you want to try and and, and exercise different muscles and and spread your wings in different ways and so they're leaving on what seems to be good terms, according to Flash executive producer show and Eric Wallace. Tom and Carlos have been an integral part of our show for seven seasons and will be greatly missed. Both are incredible talents who created beloved characters that fans and audiences around the world have come to love, which is why we're happily keeping the door open for return appearances. Um, that's good. It's a positive thing. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, uh, Carlos has been in and out for the last season or two mm -hmm. like not he hasn't been there for every episode they've got a new man in the chair affair going on um you know and tom like fucking how many different times can you how many different wells can you play 
I mean, he's uh, he's done a lot of them. They're a happy bunch up there. I mean, I haven't been up there in years, but like I did three episodes of The Flash. Mm. They're you know pretty tight knit family who enjoy each other. So it's nice. It's sad that you know all the good things come to an end, and and right now these two guys are heading off into the sunset, although they can come back and visit and whatnot. But uh, it's a happy time for those cats because they're like, all right, what's next? Like, yeah. uh, Los is a really thoughtful kid. And I remember having a chit chat with him on set once, like during, I think I was there for the second episode um, that I did. And, you know, he talked about like, trying to figure out how long he would stay with the show. He's like, I love it here, but like, I'm, my my 20s are going to be spent inside this concrete block. Mm. And, you know, shouldn't I want to live a life? Shouldn't I, you know? So he was, when I saw that announcement, I was like, you know, it, it, it makes sense. He's also a musician. He, you know, he's got some other things he wants to do rather than just vibe it yet again. Right. Yeah. And also what happens too is if you leave, you get to come back. And when you come back, you're happy to see the character and the actor is happy to be there and stuff and some big welcome home reunion scenario. So nothing good is going to come from this. Yeah. I mean, and it's, you know, the, the, the truth of it is, if you're, if you're an actor, especially a young actor, and you play your cards right, and you've had a series regular role for seven or eight years, you know, sometimes that's all you get, you know, not to be like a, a purveyor of doom and gloom, but like, Eight years as a series regular on a network show is the jackpot. You know, if you ever strike that jackpot again, then it's lightning striking twice. You know, not everybody can be, you know, Robert Urick, um, you know, or Tom Selleck, who like, you know, we're going to keep making shows for this guy until he, you know, passes away. Right. But if you get a great seven years and a show that you like with people you love um, and you can save your money and, and spend it wisely and buy yourself a house that's not past your means and, and then do the other stuff that you love and then find, you know, and maybe some of that's acting, maybe it's other stuff, maybe it's indie movies, maybe it's whatever, but you bought yourself a ticket and, you know, you rode the ride and you left happy, hopefully, knock on wood. Um, well, we wish them well. Indeed. Those two heroes. Uh, Tom Welling, responsible for one of my favorite performances of all time, that first season of Flash and, uh, you know, him playing uh earbard fawn when he was like run barry <laughs> oh fuck i still get chills run barry run yep so good that whole first season was so fucking fantastic like one of the best first seasons of television ever produced that i watched um god it was so good the man in the yellow mm -hmm. suit oh God, now I may feel like I want to go watch that again. It's so great. <laughs> Remember, oh, oh my God, I'm gonna get emotional thinking about him fucking his mom getting killed. So good, so good. <laughs> First season of that show is fucking fantastic. God damn it, so good. Um, okay, what else? Right. Somebody yeah. asked in chat what's going on. Can I say anything about Mo too? Um, I believe, what is the date? The 10th. I believe this week, perhaps, you may be seeing some imagery. Um, I think uh, some of the first press is breaking. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm at liberty to say, but um, there's a preview coming. And uh, I did an interview for it, and I know they've, I had to approve images. And so I know that you're going to see some first the the first images ever released and i think that's this coming week um but in other news i saw the teaser trailer which is fucking phenomenal <laughs> they uh they've they it's about a minute and a half they found a piece of music that's just absolute jeff's kiss is it now yeah especially with the material um but it's it's wonderful and it makes you like it like i know this fucking series in in and out and it made me go back and start watching it again i was like holy shit like that netflix marketing department they know what the fuck they're doing man 
Like they, that's the trailer I saw. It said Netflix creative or whatever the fuck. And, oh, it's, it's a great spot. So I can't say when you're going to see it, but um, if, if I'm seeing it now, then it's coming fairly soon, I guess, is what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't want to get fired. No, don't do that. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, mean, I can't, I don't have that many. Number one, I don't have the, you know, the fucking swag that Malcolm has. <laughs> You know, he talked, he literally talked about like fucking doors open. He's like that, that se three seasons on empire puts you in a, on a list in a room where people are suddenly like, I'm not even going to read your sample go like, mm -hmm. you know, it's that crazy over in this business and stuff. Um, and you know, and that, that he met the challenge, you know what I'm saying? Like fucking, he doesn't have a long resume, especially based on what we saw. Like, it's not like, oh, this guy's been working forever and stuff like that. He has, but he's not been working in the business forever and still turned in something like, like way better than anything I could have done. Yeah. And there's also the, the weirdness of Hollywood, which is that's a dude who, even though he says like I was out of the business for a long time, after he breaks back in with Empire, I am sure that there's years worth of stuff that he worked on that nobody's ever seen because Hollywood is just that way. You know, like I pitched, I sold, I wrote pilots, you know, I might have written movies and some of which got produced, some of which didn't, um, but much of which just won't ever see the light of day because that is, that's the way you can have a complete career in Hollywood um, as a screenwriter, writing things that nobody will ever watch um, and still pay your mortgage and feed your kids and buy clothes for everybody and save for retirement. That was my friend, Brian Lynch, you know, who wrote like the Minions movies and... Mm -hmm. And uh, Secret Life of Pets and stuff. First ten years he was out here. He like he wrote script after script, got paid incredibly well, but nothing got produced. Yeah, and, you know, I was like, oh my god, man, I wish I was you, just writing scripts that I get paid for, and fucking nobody ever criticizes them because they don't get made. And he's like, yeah, but they don't get made. That's the point of the story. And then he hooked up with Illumination, and then everything he did got made and stuff. Mm. So yeah, it's. That was a good chat today. Absolutely. Uh, all right, what else we got? We got one last story. It's a quickie. But uh, did you ever watch Pennyworth? No, I didn't. The Alfred show. Young Alfred. Baby Young Alfred. Young Alfred, indeed. Um, which is on Epics, a cable channel you may or may not have uh, in, your, in your coterie of channels on your, on your remote. Um, it has done two seasons on Epics, um, during which I'm not sure how many people watched it. I see it every year gets put up for, for award consideration. Um, but uh, the show is now plotting a move from Epix to HBO Max for a potential third season. Look at that, man. That's a vote of confidence right there. Indeed. HBO Max likes what they've seen for two seasons enough to be like, we'll take it. Yep. So part of the deal, which they're still negotiating, would involve a new season three and additionally the previous episodes from the first two seasons. So you could have all of it in one place if you'd like to watch the you know kind of weirdly period slash contemporary slash <clears throat> a little um temporally fluid look at the origins of kind of um badass british london chauffeur slash butler slash bodyguard slash spy alfred pennyworth is it uh are there any masks um uh, I'm trying to remember. I've seen like three or four episodes, and in those three or four episodes, there were no masks yet. Although, you know, he does get to hang out a bit with young Thomas Wayne, who's a billionaire and swinging London as well. Um, so, yeah, they don't quite fight criminal masterminds, but it's, it's, it's interesting. It's worth a look. What, uh, what year, when does it take place? 40s? 60s. 60s London. Yeah. So you get a little bit of that swinging 60s, a little bit of that, uh, you know, not quite as cheeky as Austin Powers, but it's a little summer of lovey. If they put it on HBO Max, they'll get another set of eyeballs from me. Ta-da. Uh, is that the news? That is the news, my friend. There it is, kids. Mark brought you the news, man. You wanted to hear about the news? Well, the news has been heard about. Thanks to It's been done, bro. He broke it right here. And you can't <laughs> fix it. It's unfixable. <laughs> Our news. Hey, Banff boy.
It's time for questions. Bamf. Yeah, that's expensive sound effect can only mean one thing, kids. <laughs> time for Q&A with JC. JC, I see you being very active in chat. Uh, yeah, I'm just talking to people. Talking somebody to just people. somebody just messaged us from Moscow and uh, it it sparked uh, sparked something in my head. I just finished watching which I think Mark turned talked about on the show like 6 months ago. The Wind of Change podcast. Have you heard of this? So good, right? It is so good. It's eight episodes about how the CIA may have written the song Wind of Change and given it to the Scorpions. It's so oh, good. I've heard a version of the story to like infiltrate and bring down the, the Soviet wall. Union. Soviet Union. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. And that's a what is what it's a podcast? It's a podcast mm -hmm. from uh a journalist from the New Yorker. So good. Are they talking about turning it into a movie or series yet? So mm -hmm. Go ahead, I don't know. I was listening to it. I'm like, this would be better than Argo. And then in like episode two, he's like, this story reminds me of Argo. And it's like, well, okay, this has already been sold, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I remember hearing uh, like about six months ago that there was a bit of a bidding war to see who was going to get their hands on Winds of Change. Because, yeah, like you listen to one episode, you're like, oh, I see exactly what this movie is. You know, you listen to like four or five of them. It's like, oh, that took a turn I didn't expect. You know, and then by the time you get to eight, it's uh, it's it's kind of amazing and and a wonderful, wonderful story. So this is, I, I might be doing this for an audience of one, but uh, and I probably shouldn't say this out loud, but what the hell? Uh, one of my friends used to work for Doc McGee, and mm. <clears throat> we would go out to the Rainbow on Sunset Strip and drink until two o'clock in the morning, and then go back to Doc's office and in doc's office he literally has a jar with a million dollars that he shredded sitting in it so everything you hear in that podcast about doc mcgee is totally believable <laughs> anyways uh, that, it, endorsing it, a it, podcast that has nothing to do with us but it's no. Well, no, that's people. People tune into this show to hear about shit <laughs> that they they know about and shit they don't know about. So you do you're doing exactly what you should be. Doing. Uh, before we head into the Q and A, though, uh, a lot of people in chat have brought this up. Frank McRae just died. Uh, Frank was an actor in License to Kill and The Last Action Hero. No NFL t a player turned actor who appeared in the James Bond film License to Kill. And then the last action hero died April 29th of a heart attack in Santa Monica. He was 80. Um, born in Memphis, uh, he attended Tennessee State University. Uh, and he was a defensive tackle for the Chicago Bears and the LA Rams. But here's his list of movies. Last action hero, Hard Times, Norma Ray, Red Dawn, Big Wednesday, Fist with Sylvester Stallone. Who he also appeared in with Par in Paradise Alley, Lock Up, and Rocky Two. Hmm. <clears throat> um, uh, he was in National Lampoon's Vacation. I believe he was the cop. You know, who was like, he treated me like a dog, Mister Wally. He took away my. <laughs> he's, he's the 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 Wally World security guard with John Candy, if mm -hmm. I remember correctly. Um. He was also in uh, 1941, Batteries Not Included, and Used Cars. What a list. Rest in peace, sir. Yeah, there's is, is a huge list of movies and TV shows. Um, a guy who, you know, was, uh, you know, he was never the star, but those cats are the glue, the cartilage of a movie man and he was so familiar you saw him again and again and stuff you know that's usually the mark of a quality uh character actor as mm -hmm. you see him a lot all the time but sadly you won't see frank mccray anymore uh dead at age 80. um there is one other piece of news we didn't cover because it's not expressly about the the nerd stuff but 
It is the ongoing travails of the Golden Globes, um, which had fought, had come under attack um, about a month ago or so, I want to say, by the LA Times, who discovered that like in the 40 year history of the Globes, they have only ever had like two black members of the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, which has only ever been like, you know, 40 or 45 people at a clip. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, after coming under fire, they, they made some apparently half-assed attempt to try and diversify their membership, which fell um, on deaf ears. And so all of the studios are beginning to pull out, Amazon, Netflix, um, I think Paramount might have pulled out. Um, Tom Cruise has returned his three Golden Globes that he won. And uh, I think as of today, NBC has canceled the Golden Globes as a telecast. Oh no, whatever will we do without the Golden Globes? My goodness, it's unclear. I think, however, we shall persevere. Um, so strange, but at the same time, strange that it even lasted as long as it has. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the least taste, the weirdest boondoggle, but okay. It was an excuse for famous people to get dressed up. Um, hey, Banff boy. Get your ass back. Bam. Yeah. Uh, Bam Foy, uh, let me ask you this. Um, God damn it, it was in chat and somebody brought it up and I was like, oh shit, I gotta, I gotta bring that up. Fuck. Something that you did or saw. Sh Schmodown? Yes, the Schmodown. Thank you. What happened with Schmodown? I, I won my Schmodown match. It was a Star Wars match. So it wasn't probably, I didn't get any cool world questions, but um, right before the match, I was, it was on May the 4th. So I was at Scum and Villainy and the manifold on the soda gun exploded. And so it was spraying freezing cold seltzer water all over the bar at like two o'clock in the afternoon. So I'm trying to fix it with duct tape. I'm drenched. Then I had to jump in my car sit in traffic and I got home just as I was going on the show. And one of the first questions was who directed Rogue One? And I couldn't pull it out of my head. And so I've been getting endless shit from everybody for the last week about who directed Rogue One. But I still won. I still pulled it off. <laughs> Oh, um, Gary. Congratulations, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully, Hopefully now I've not. been on, I've been on Twitter razzing people. I'm in the like minor leagues, so I'm starting to razz people in the in the real schmodown that I'm coming for them in the Star Wars division. <laughs> um, the uh, another news story we should probably hit on. And some people, somebody was like, is it news if you just read a dead person's body of work? Uh, Tawny Katane passed away, age 59. Mm. And Tawny Katane, you know, people of my generation, Mark's generation, remember from the White Snake videos, mm. the cover of Rat albums. Uh, she, but uh, I saw her uh, first performance, I think it was her first performance, um, in a movie theater. I went to see Bachelor Party. I was, uh, at, yes. I was staying at my sister's college the summer of 83. I guess that's when Bachelor Party came out, 84. And, Sounds about uh, right. Yeah, I think that's right, 84. And um, like a bunch of the sisters in her dorm like took me to see Bachelor Party, which was an R-rated movie. And um, that was the first time I, I kind of like saw it. Tawny Katane and fell a little bit in love with her and whatnot. She was in The Perils of Gwendolyn, Witchboard. Um, she was in some Hercules as well. But uh, the music videos, you know, she was married to that dude from White Snake for a red hot minute. I think mm -hmm. stuff. But uh, she just passed away. Jen, yeah. Jen really wanted to name our daughter Tawny after Tawny Katane. And I why? Said no. why? Why specifically after Tony Katane? What's she just the... thought it was such a cool '80s name. She just loved it. I he very like, much is. We cannot. We cannot. So we named her Jocelyn, and we spelled it weird so we could call her Jin, like a Star Wars name. 
more, a little more on brand than Tony. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although Jen and I, the Jen Tony and, Kane, uh, fucking cantina. It's the scum and villainy cantina. <laughs> Jen and I met at a rat concert though, at the House of Blues. So it is on brand. That's cool. Oh my God. At the now gone House of Blues. Now gone. Now it's a Chase Bank and a high priced apartment building. <laughs> right. That's what they built there. Um, all right. The QA begins, man. JC's going to pick three questions. Me and Mark are going to try our damnedest to answer those questions to the best of our abilities. What do you um, got? All right. This is uh, from Fripp25. What do you guys want the next Indiana Jones MacGuffin to be? Um, a, what do you a, mean? the thing they're chasing the uh, oh, know, so the, like whether it's the lost ark or the fucking uh, holy grail or crystal skull. Mm -hmm. What year is it that? We don't know. We figured though the last one was the 60s. Um, I thought the last one was the 50s because it was very atomic age. Bam, the last one was, yeah, the last one was the, the 50s because it was aliens, atomic age, nuke the fridge, all, so we all of get that to fun bring stuff. It, so the next one, so I'm in charge of this hypothetical Indiana Jones movie, so I get to pick the era and what they're going after. I feel like it should be, like, yeah, like late 60s, 70s, maybe. I'm going for 70s and it's Bigfoot, Indiana Jones versus Bigfoot. He's got to investigate that footage where he fucking lumbers and then he looks at the camera and shit. <laughs> and it's all three. It's it's Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and uh, what's another thing would have been on In Search Of? Yeah. Wild Boy? Is it Bigfoot and Wild Boy meets Indiana Jones? <laughs> That'd be amazing. Bigfoot, <laughs> Wild Boy versus fucking Indiana Jones. <laughs> um, it would be Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, and... <laughs> He's done aliens with Crystal Skull, so I don't want to say like fucking Martians, but Jersey Devil. Um, come on, Mark, keep it real. Um, cults, like remember mm. seven, eight, the rise of satanic cults. So he's dealt with cults a little bit. We're not well, you know, the dark versions of religion, i.e., Kali Ma and stuff like that. With that, I think technically that could be considered a cult, right? Um, you know, it was a, a thuggy death cult. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's on brand. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm saying my Indiana Jones movie takes place in the 70s and it involves him fucking facing Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and what was the third thing? Um, cults. And Satan. Satan. Bamf. Mary's baby slash fucking exorcist slash race with the devil kind of satanism that sweet sweet 70s satanism that we all wanted to be a part of and you know now it's been so fucking glamorized and like it's so bougie but back then that was when satanism was metal kids <laughs> yeah boy what do you have to say uh there was a i believe it was a star wars tales comic uh probably 20 years ago now that indiana jones is adventuring through some lush thick jungle trying to find bigfoot and it turns out bigfoot was chewbacca and that the millennium falcon had crashed into this jungle a long time ago uh and it's super fun <laughs> uh mark um i think it's indiana jones and the titanium hip <laughs> because Harrison Ford is not a spring chicken. That's yeah, very true, man. It, it, honestly, it should be Indiana Jones meets Cocoon. <laughs> where they're After like, you die, you'll never go. Old. Like I'm gonna go with them because <laughs> I'll never get older and I'll never die. <laughs> Who let this guy into my fucking house? <laughs> um, oh. All right, Bamf boy. That's one question down. You gotta feed us another goddamn question. Bamf. All right. Uh, we got another one. This one is from um, Christopher Hyde. Uh, Christopher wants to know: We have all the, we all have those movie scores that when we hear, we are instantly happy. What would be on your Mount Rushmore of movie scores? Uh, a franchise like Star Wars would include. It would be like Star Wars would be one thing. 
I think we killed him. <laughs> um, all right, so my Mount Rushmore of movie franchises. Scores. <clears throat> scores? It's only scores. We're talking about the music. It's even easier. Uh, John Williams, Star Wars scores. Rather, mm -hmm. it's not the composer, it's the scores themselves are getting. Mm -hmm. uh, Star Wars, Superman, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and one more from Mount Rushmore. Uh, uh, Batman, Tim Burton, 1989, uh, Danny Elfman's Batman score. That's my Mount Rushmore. Okay. Oh, wait a second, Mount, uh, yeah, because it's not yeah. the, if it was the composer, then Williams would be appearing three times. Right. But it's not the composer, it's the scores. Correct. All right, Superman, Star Wars, the collective Star Wars catalog. Uh, the collective Indiana Jones catalog, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and uh, and uh, Danny Elfman's Batman score. Okay, um, beat that, beat that with a stick. Um, Basil Poldoris's Conan the Barbarian score. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, no, he's um, bum 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 yeah. bum 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 the the Star Trek Two Wrath of Khan score. I like it, um, which I love. Um, you have to go faster because Zesty Clam in chat just said, <laughs> "I know it's free, but goddamn, this boring. This is boring." Thank you, Zesty Clam. Sorry. Um, yeah, sorry, we're not, we're not thrill a minute here, man. Yeah, you missed. Sir. We had you know fucking Malcolm Spellman was giving it. Now we're in the cool down hour. This is like the, almost the end of the show. Yeah, come on, man. Um, you can't I think say I also nice. Go, don't say nothing at all. That's all. I also go Star Wars. Um, clearly, you can't not go Star Wars. Um, um, <coughs> fuck, you got me thinking about Excalibur now, which has the... the... <laughs> Um, fuck. See now, my my head keeps getting stuck with soundtracks now, and so I'm like, I would want Purple Rain on there, or I would want fucking the Muppet movie on there. But the scores of those movies aren't so great as much as the soundtracks are great. Right. You're talking needle drop. That's a whole different Mount Rushmore. That's a totally different Mount Rushmore. So I think for my fourth, um, I'm going to go uh, Harry Potter. Yeah, that is a yeah. pretty, pretty good score. I mean, that's John Williams as well, isn't mm -hmm. it? John Williams, the king of the score that you could hum or do out loud, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like nobody's saying that about like fucking Philip Glass or something like that. Or, <laughs> or who's the guy that does the, 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 you know, fucking Man of Steel and stuff? Oh yeah, Hans Zimmer. You can't, it's tough to do. What is um, what is the Dark Knight theme? Um, there, there kind of isn't one really. Is that right? I mean, there's there's a score, but there's no and shit like that. It's it's a bit it's Nolan-y, which means that there's not real theme because I think they were like the anti theme. Um, it ain't like Elfman's. -na 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 no. No, not even close. God, remember the opening of Batman 1989? Just that fucking haunting music, like that score. 
told you from the opening credits that like this ain't we're not goofing around like this ain't batman you know from the tv show this is fucking moody because it had that like that haunting like something bad happened <laughs> to this boy's past something bad happened something bad happened so i'm trying to entertain zesty clam mark i'm doing my it's guy not gonna work man he's he's just decided that he's just not a fan i'm playing a zesty clam everyone else might as well jump off the show <laughs> I'm trying to win one heart tonight. <laughs> Starts with one, Mark. The DJ stole my, saved my life tonight. What about uh, no Ennio Morricone on there? I mean, Good Betty Ugly is pretty strong. Like, the, it's hard to... Or the Untouchables. <laughs> Such a good. See, I feel like we're missing. We're 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 Bamf. giving away a oh, great Bamf. game show on sci-fi or something like. Like, guess that. What's the score? <laughs> we have celebrities performing acapella, acapella versions of their favorite, <laughs> favorite scores. Legit pitch that. That's a good fucking show, man. I'm just saying. That's I that's just fun. Saying. Like you, we can literally fucking like you just try. You go like, all right. It's kind of like name that tune, but it's like, can you understand the theme I'm doing? Does this make any sense to you? Yeah. Does this sound like something? <laughs> uh, Bam Boy, you had some thoughts. I was gonna say, I mean, Lord of the Rings is an easy pick, or Star Wars are pro- probably would be what I would I would put, but just to be different, I would pick. Top Gun, I think, is really strong. Uh, Rocky, the Rocky franchise is really strong. Is Rocky, uh, yeah, I, you know what the Bill Conti score is. Da-na-na, da-na-na. Yeah, that and, is pretty. And then if it's franchi- franchise, you get Ludwig redoing it in Creed and updating it. Um, I was already sold. You don't have to fucking sell Creed to get me there. I was already on board. You're like, hey, man, what about Creed? (laughs) Oh, dude, I forgot. I forgot. Um, Flash Gordon by The Great Queen. Wow, that was a great score. Yeah. I mean, and it's not even just the two or three pop songs that are on there, but the whole fucking score. Toto's score for Dune. That's, That's not Rushmore, though. I don't know. It makes me feel good every time I listen to it. You're a Rushmore. You do whatever you want. Yeah, it's your Rushmore that Dakota nobody goes to. <laughs> it's your Rushmore, Rushmore or less. Yeah. Yes, yes, JC. I was also going to say The Natural, which is the fanfare for a common man, which they use on in every epic Olympics type thing uh, I'm have to, ever. I would pull it up and listen to it now, but you know we'd get fucking excited. <laughs> Uh, and I'm then, of, of of course, Back to the Future. Who did that? Is it Goldsmith? Uh, no. Uh, Back to the Future is Alan Silvestri. Silvestri, Silvestri. yeah. There it is. I mean, and also, fucking, you know, I mean, there's some great music in Endgame. Yeah. Agreed. I just watched the last hour of that on the plane on my way home. Because why would you not? God damn it, that movie is so fucking great. Two of my favorite moments in cinematic history happen in like the third act of that movie. One is, you know, fucking Cap picking up the the hammer. And the other is Tony Stark, you know, going, and I am iron man and just the way he fucking like he has such a fuck you face when he snaps like fuck you so awesome <laughs> um all right what else we got bamf oh, okay man. last question okay. uh from andrew chambers uh after 38 years i just read my first comic book ever hmm. the watchman what 
would be your top graphic novels you'd recommend to a new reader? Uh, for me, <clears throat> I would say um, The Dark Knight Returns, seminal Batman work by Frank Miller. I would say Mage, The Hero Discovered by Matt Wagner. I would say, they already said The Watchmen, correct? I would say Heroes um, by Kurt Busiek and Alex Ross. I would say God Loves, Man Kills by Chris Claremont. Am I correct on that? Got mm -hmm. it. Maybe John Byrne as well. Um, I would say uh, The Longbow Hunters by Mike Grell. Um, this is a, nobody ever shouts this out, but Camelot 3000 Ooh. by Alan Moore. Um, anything by Alan Moore, but you already got, you got the Watchmen, you're already moving in the right direction. Was that Alan Moore? Did he do Camelot 3000? Yeah. Wow. Wait, now you got me doubting myself. Yeah, I'm, I'm like 100% sure. Mike Barr. <laughs> I was just way wrong. You know why? Brian Boland was one of the mm. artists. But still, yeah, Mike Barr. Oh my God. Why the fuck did I? I smoked Mike Barr away <laughs> from Camelot 3000 and literally smoked Alan Moore into the chair. How strange. Speaking of Alan Moore, though, Swamp Thing. Mm. Camelot 3000, Mike Barr's Camelot 3000, uh, but but Alan Moore's Swamp Thing run. Um, uh, I don't know. That's a bunch from me. What about you, Mark? That's pretty good. Um, let's see. Why the Last Man by Brian K. Vaughan and Pia Guerra. Um, the Sandman by Nick Gaiman, Nick Gaiman, Neil Gaiman and Assorted Artists. Nick, Nick. Nick Gaiman's his, his, his cousin who's muscle in the fucking <laughs> British mob. Boy, I'm, I'm Nick Gaiman. Oh, come here. You, go, you all a cop up there. Buy me brother's books, fancy books, or I'll break your fucking arm, mate. Spare a pence for <laughs> Nicky Gaiman. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Kingdom Come. Great call. Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. All Star Superman by Grant Morrison. Um, Fearful hmm. Symmetry. Um, or uh, Craven's Last Hunt, I believe Ooh, that's a good other's one. name. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Hard Boiled by Frank Miller. Um, the subject matter is... Jeff, Jeff Darrow. Yeah, Hard Boiled. Um, and Sin City. Um, ba -ba 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 and Planetary. I think planetary can can broaden some horizons a little bit, um, but I think all of those are a pretty good place to start if you're if you're looking to to dabble. And if your entree is Watchmen, then then I think you are you are well served by any of these choices, good sir. Uh, oh my God, zesty clam popping up with the fucking criticisms. Isn't this list for newbies? Dark Knight Returns and others like it would be too demanding regarding page layout and clutter on the page. Jesus, zesty clam, clam the fuck up. You know, also, if you come with a comment, come with something positive. Doesn't always have to be something fucking negative and shit. And also Dark Knight Returns is on a nine panel grid. And if you can't navigate a nine panel grid, it's perfect for beginners. It is not complex at all. Listen to that guy, that guy. Listen to that guy. Yeah. Is it nine panels or 12 panels? Even if it's 12 panels, it's still pretty easy to read. You just can't please this fucking zesty clam, Mark. You can't do it. I've been trying all night. I've been playing right to him. He'll, he gives me nothing except notes. 
He's a zesty clam. Yeah, he's more than zesty. And it's a spicy clam is what he is. Maybe there's some sand caught in that clam. Let's make him a little irritable. I'm just I'm not making any threats, Mark, but clams, where I'm from, clams get shucked. <laughs> they get casinoed. <laughs> <laughs> um is that did we answer? I think we answered. Banff boy return. Banff. Uh, we did our job. Can we go home now? Can we go to sleep? <laughs> I, I think we are done. We've been on for a while. It has been a three-hour show, um, and we only had a half-hour guest. <laughs> you know, we detoured for a while. Uh, we, you know, the Joss Whedon thing took a lot of time. Indeed. Um, but you know, hopefully, fucking. Hopefully it's not an audience full of zesty clams. Hopefully some of you are happy clams. Hmm. Had a good time tonight. If you had a good time tonight, you thank old JC. He's the fucking uh, Oracle, the Barbara Gordon, who's making this shit happen, fucking casting us out into the universe and shit. Keeping us warm for when we finally get to return to the scum and villainy cantina and take our rightful places behind the bar and do this shit live with people as they get drunk and pretend we're funny. <laughs> we thank you, JC. How's the bar going? How was May the 4th? May the 4th was good. We've been we've been busy. Um, I mean, we can't put a lot of people in there, but we've had lines every weekend, Friday, Saturdays. So uh, people showing the love, which has been awesome. Lines outside the door, lines in the bathroom stalls. Come on down to Scum and Villainy <laughs> Cantina. <laughs> Drug Haven on Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say uh, on may the 4th which we're kind of crossing the streams but um the hobbits mary and pippin came in yeah i saw I, I saw that in your one of your feeds what happened there they they came in to talk about their new podcast and talk about being in these big franchises uh, and they sang the hobbit drinking song sitting at at the bar so oh nice look at yeah. you Instantly, you started pulling down all the decor and turned it into a fucking Hobbiton bar. <laughs> <laughs> you little trend jumper. Um, yes, we thank JC. And Indeed. don't forget, if you want to thank him for real, in real life, go to the Scum and Villainy Cantina. But be, be, be prepared to wait in line, apparently. Yeah. You know where you won't wait in line? To fucking sit here and worship at the altar. I keep pointing in the wrong direction. Of the one and only fucking high priest of this bullshit give it up for fuck <laughs> damn it it's so backwards give it up for mark bernard on one screen you're right next to me but over there you're on the other side give it up for mark bernard <laughs> thank you sir uh, i'll be the high priest of whatever you need my friend <laughs> oh fucking then be in my indiana jones movie you could be the high priest of the fucking satanic cult and shit and will be. be a good cult leader because you got a kind face nobody's expecting it from you like we wouldn't put you up front you'd be like his sidekick through most of the movie but in the third act we revealed that it was fucking you all along and nobody suspects the sweet face guy who's got a few notes about your fucking hbo series and shit <laughs> <laughs> It was him all along. <laughs> with the <laughs> fucking notes. Aggressive, aggressive motherfucker. He had so many notes. Should have seen it coming. <laughs> he stabbed me with his notes. <laughs> um, somebody asked in chat, where's the Jeff's Kiss shirt? They're coming. <laughs> they're coming. The only person who can fucking do it is they're busy. So they're coming, I swear to you. Um, I've <laughs> seen them and they are jeff's kiss and and when we have him you'll be let me tell you something when i fucking announce that they're for sale on this show if i don't fucking sell out on day one i'm gonna find all these people that go where's the jeff's kiss shirt and be like what happened and they'll be like we bought them there were only three of us we just kept saying it over and over and i'll be like i built my entire economy on the fact that i thought we were gonna move a thousand shirts some one guy in his house with 500 shirts. We're like, I bought as many as I could. Yeah, he's like, I'm divorced. It was a cute joke. It wasn't that great. <laughs> and that's what they say about Fat Man Beyond. It's a cute joke, but it's not that great. But you keep tuning in and we love you for it, ladies and gentlemen. Come back next week. We'll do more of the same. Probably more like on the weekends. Or are we finally going to the bar next week? We might be going. Who knows? We got to work it out. 
we'll let you know, kids. Indeed. Stay tuned. We'll let you know. Uh, in the meantime, uh, that, my friends, is Fat Man uh, Beyond for this evening. I'm Kevin Smith. And I am Mark Bernard. And you are the people that should tune in same next week, same bat, same bat, fat time, same fat channel. And that fat channel, of course, is smart dad. God damn it, I can't. <laughs> oh, a fucking witch took my tongue, Mark. Uh, Smodcast.com or YouTube.com slash Kevin Smith. Jeff's kiss, kids. Mwah.